listening to episode 265 of Mito Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today, I'm interviewing Matt Kaufman of Integrative Thoughts. Matt is a hair tissue mineral analysis or HTMA practitioner. And one of the things that makes him unique is that he's tried a lot of different protocols like myself. So for a while, he was on the iron dumping protocol, the iron overload protocol, and then he tried high copper. I did both those things. But he says it wasn't until he got into HTMA testing that his health started to radically improve. If you've never heard of HTMA before, I think this show is a great overview. And even for seasoned veterans in the field, I think there's also a lot of interesting information to glean from this show. So some of the things that Matt talks about in the show are why you want to shift between the different oxidation states, why HTMA is not just looking for high or low levels of minerals. He breaks down a lot of the different mineral ratios and what they mean, whether it's calcium to magnesium or sodium to potassium. He talks about how he utilizes sauna therapy and coffee enemas, why it doesn't work to megadose zinc in order to lower your high copper, the power of melatonin for chelating toxic metals, why it can be a good thing to supplement calcium, and why you shouldn't fear calcification. He talks about his favorite zeolite product, his thoughts on blood testing, ozone therapy. We do a little analysis of my chart that was two years apart, which isn't ideal, but he talks about some of my high and low levels and what they mean. This was a really fun show. Matt's really articulate and he can really break down the concepts well. So enjoy the show. Here is Matt Kaufman. And welcome to the show. How's it going, Matt? Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. Uh, you, you were saying you've been a listener of my show for a while, and you have your podcast, and I I love your shows. So this is a, a great collaboration. Yeah, it's actually super interesting. Um, it's just like full circle even coming here because my friend Carly, she actually was like this big vegan advocate forever, which we've all fell for that trap. We can get into that if you want a little bit. Um, and so she like transitioned over eating to eating meat. And, you know, I kind of helped her through that transition because I had already been began eating meat again and, you know, trying to make her not feel bad about eating meat and talking to her about regenerative. And we've done some lives on her uh, Instagram. And she was actually the one that sent me your podcast. And then I listened to it for a while, was into the morally stuff and then uh, got listened to the show with Clark and got into mineral balancing. And that kind of brought me back to hell. So it was kind of like. I helped her get out of the veganism and get her health back. And then her, by her sending me this show, I heard Clark and got into the mineral balancing world. And then now somehow I'm sitting here in front of you on the actual show. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think some people could see kind of the roller coaster of all the different ideas that I've thrown out there through the various guests and all the really extreme differences, you know, between the different protocols, you know, iron dumping, high copper loading, you know, <laughs> and I, uh, I think of all the shows I've had, I really like interviewing the hair tissue mineral analysis practitioners. Um, Adam Robert Selig recently, he's awesome. Uh, Clark Engelbert, he's awesome. Um, I think you're awesome. And just the information in, in this field of, uh, mineral balancing, it's, uh, it's kind of never ending. I mean, there's <laughs> so much to learn, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll try to do it justice. I think people like Clark and Robert are amazing and they have dialed in and probably done a decade or Robert looks a little bit older, maybe even decades into research in minerals. And the more you get into them, you realize that it's like more than just like this synergism and antagonism. Right. And then there's like downstream effects of every mineral and stuff as well. And if you're not actually reading a chart and getting a good grasp of like what nutrients people need for what oxidation rate they're in, whether it's slow or fast, and it gets very confusing. And, you know, like we talked about before the show, you can lose a client in a lot of that, but you, it is good to know and have a good grasp of to be able to read the chart and to be able to dose appropriately. Mm -hmm. Well, before we get into um, hair <laughs> testing and mineral balancing, 
I wanted to start just talking about your story and you had a quite a history of, I think you've talked about like addiction and a bunch of things you healed from and yeah, um, my story is quite bizarre. I, I, I'm not really uh, quite a, really a health expert or really even a bio hacker. I'm kind of more just like this kid from the hood. I grew up in Flint, Michigan, and you know, my dad got kicked out of the house when I was like two months old. My mom caught him smoking crack for for that matter. Um, so he was just never around. And so I grew up without a father. Uh, my older brother, his father was not around. Both of them lived really close. It was just kind of like deadbeat dad type of um, scenario. My mom even took care of my two older cousins. Neither of their dads were around because my aunt like moved to Tennessee and we lived in Michigan. And it was just like a crazy household of like my mom bartending and being gone a lot. And then me, us heathens just kind of like roaming around the house, like doing whatever we wanted. And then as they were a lot older than me and grew up and got out of the house, my mom did start dating a guy, but then he was just like this black guy from the hood and he was selling cocaine and like, just like didn't have a job, but was like, just always had like people from the hood at my house with like guns on their hips and like betting thousand dollars on basketball games. And a lot of that stuff, you know, I, when you're younger, it just was like whatever. And you just went with it and I was playing sports and I always got like good grades in school and I was, you know, smart and took care of all of that. But you know, that stuff actually does build over time when you never really got any kind of like emotional, you know, satisfaction from father really nor mother, because my mom was gone a lot. You know, I would be in school all day and then she would work at night. So you just seen her kind of intermittently, not like these family dinners that you hear people talking about. And, you know, I did have close relationships with my cousins and stuff like that. And as I got older and quit playing sports, it kind of led into first off more so like alcoholism, typical, like college kid, like working, you know, serving tables, drinking a lot and going to school. And no one really questions like any of your like substance problems when you're in college. Right. And then getting out of college, I actually, um, started growing cannabis. So it was like real new and Michigan just approved it and it was legal. And I had a buddy who was trying to do it at his house. And so then I'm like full on just like making money and I'm my own boss and I'm like not just smoking cannabis. I'm like taking handfuls of Vicodins and I'm taking Adderall and then I'm like going to festivals and doing LSD and Molly and like just all these crazy different substances. And it just like took a hold of me for like six or seven years. But I do want to backtrack a little bit because I think some of this makes sense. Like when I was younger, I also had a lot of immunological problems. So I always had like ear infections and I was always on antibiotics. Like I can't really remember a time when I like wasn't on antibiotics for these different ear problems. I went to the ear and I was like always missing school for like seeing the ear, nose and throat doctor. And um, I had like 12 different ear surgeries. Like they just like kept giving me tubes. Like I'm like at some point as I got an older, I'm like, apparently the tubes weren't working. Like how many times can you get tubes before they don't work? And then um, I actually had both of my eardrums reconstructed at two separate times. I burst the eardrum in middle school and they basically have to like cut behind your ear, flip your ear open. Nowadays, I think they just use a laser, but like back in the day, it was like they cut your ear off, basically flip it over and then take a tissue from somewhere else and repair the eardrum. And then the same thing happened like five years later on my other ear. So I have like two reconstructed ears and all these immune system issues. I had a bunch of mercury fillings growing up because I had cavities all the time, was drinking soda. I mean, real standard American diet stuff, just like mac and cheese out of the box, cereal. So like, I'm really not like this guy who grew up around like spiritual people or hippies or anything. Just, I really ended up like after the stint with doing all of the drugs, I moved down to Florida and was like, all right, I'm going to quit. Like I gave up the growing cannabis. It kind of got oversaturated. Big money was buying into it. I had made my money and I was good. So I sold off everything and like moved down to Florida for a different life. And when I gave up the cannabis and the booze and, you know, all the different Adderall and things that I was using to kind of suppress I, what I think was probably the beginning stages of the chronic illness. Like I was using the Adderall for energy, the drinks to kind of calm me down, smoking cannabis. So when you're using all these substances and you feel a little off, you think it's probably just because you've been using too many drugs or you're just like not being that healthy. And then you move somewhere and you're getting sunlight and you're going on runs and you're trying to feel better. And then I just realized exactly how bad my brain fog and fatigue like really was. And so from there, I just started seeing different doctors. I've spent, you know, close to probably a hundred grand over the last like five years between biohacks and doctors. And I lived in mold and threw everything away and had to rebuy everything. So I can go like any direction you want from there. 
<laughs> you got the whole gamut of stuff going. <laughs> it's, it's kind of insane. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I had I had the same kind of upbringing, uh, drinking a lot of soda out of aluminum cans, and it's funny seeing aluminum on my hair tests. It's not surprising because I just think of probably a good twenty years of consistent soda. Out of, I mean, it's one thing to drink like Mexican Coke out of glass you know, way better versus like phosphoric acid leaching aluminum out of the can. Right. Yeah. And I think honestly, it's, it's, it's infiltrated the food system in other ways, you know, mm -hmm. processed foods have like the baking powder, or baking Delta soda, cheese, and, I think. And just, yeah, I mean, you, I, I live right by the airport, so I'm sure I'm breathing some in if I go outside and go on a walk. So, I mean, it's kind of hard to get away from. And that's why I like to do the mineral balancing, not just to detox the metals that have built up over time, but also as like your future protection, right? Because if you have the minerals balanced in a way, then you're kind of protecting yourself from that future exposure that you know, you're going to get. Mm -hmm. I think one of the recent things before you got into uh, hair testing, you tried the high copper dosing for a while, right? And felt good initially. And <laughs> Yeah, well, it started, it's kind of crazy. I started seeing doctors and was getting all these functional blood tests and labs. And one thing I always say is like, I went out to Dr. Minkoff because he's like this prestigious, like everybody knows him. I heard him on podcasts. I'm like, well, I live 30 minutes from this guy. I was kind of going to, I was back and forth between, am I going to go see Dr. John Laurence or go see um, uh, Dr. Minkoff? And Dr. John Laurence is like an hour and 20. Minkoff was more like 30, 35. So I was like, whatever. They sound like they're both getting to the root cause of like chronic illnesses just in different ways. So that whole protocol was just one of the doctors that I seen and it was like 20 K. And so I was like out there, um, twice a week doing all these crazy therapies. I was out there like five, seven hours a day, like doing OCAT saunas and ozone IVs and glutathione IVs and, uh, PMF and all these like allergy, uh, like Eastern medicine things that they were doing. And it was interesting enough. They did do some, some allergy around my egg allergy. And I've never, um, actually re reacted to an egg ever since that. Thing. So that was one good thing that came from that. But after I did that, I still had a bunch of brain fog. And that was like me kind of like, I had seen multiple doctors and people reading my genetics and stuff leading up to that. And then I was finally like, all right, no one's coming to save you at this point. Like if Dr. Minkoff couldn't do it, like you're just going to have to figure this, figure this out. And so first I was doing morally. Um, I didn't like go through RCP practitioner or anything. I just read his book, heard all your shows with him and was playing around with that low dose copper and, you know, doing all of the other things on his protocol, the no vitamin D and, you know, the whole food C and all of that. And that didn't really do much for me, like quite really literally at all. I like didn't feel much difference at all. And then we went into, I started listening to Jason Hommel and then I joined his group and we were both in there for a while. And that sounded interesting. I'm kind of like a renegade. I, clearly I've done tons of drugs and I didn't die. So I'm like, well, I don't know if like, if this is going to kill me, I don't think so. These guys seem all right. So I'm playing around with the copper and you know, my wife really, she thought it was great and she was even doing it for a little bit. And then same thing as me kind of hit it like a plateau. But for me, I was a lot sicker than her. Obviously she just had like some brain fog and stuff. And I just was doing good. I was eliminating some parasites, you know, I was like feeling better. I got some color back, a little bit of energy back. And you know, I think some of that was from the high dose zinc. That was the first time I had actually supplemented zinc because I've been ever since I quit being a uh, vegan, I just been eating all tons of like regenerative grass fed red meat. So I didn't really ever think that I would need a zinc supplement until I got in like the mineral balancing world. But on Jason Hommel's protocol, he kind of recommended, you know, that higher zinc as well. So I was like even playing around with like two and 300 milligrams for a while. And I was like, breathing better, sleeping better. So I was like, well, the zinc, I think actually makes me feel better than even the copper does, honestly. And, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of different nutrients on that with the, the boron and the borax and everything. So I was playing around with all of it and the high dose iodine, but there was a plateau after a while. So it makes me think that there was a potential in the beginning that I was in fast oxidation, which we tend to get people a little bit more copper. And then it probably shifted over at some point. And then I just no longer felt better. And then that's when I started like really getting into the mineral balancing stuff. Did your uh, skin ever change color? Cause that was, that was a shocker for me when that started happening. <laughs> I was on the copper sulfate and I was just using it mainly topically. I, I think I tried it orally a few times. I'm like, this is gross. And then I go to see my parents and my mom's like, why are your hands uh, a different color? <laughs> and she was worried. I was like, I think they were blue or something. 
I'm like, oh, it's fine. I have some some vitamin C. So I just went to the sink and broke a capsule open and rubbed it. And the vitamin C did reduce and got rid of the color. Uh, it actually turned, I think, red after. <laughs> Neither of those are good. <laughs> right. <laughs> First you're blue, then you're red. Oh, man. Yeah. But that it, same thing. Yeah, I started taking a lot more zinc. And I think that's what I felt much better on. Um, you did mention the oxidation rates. And that's something that's fascinating to me. Like on my test, uh, my recent one, like a month ago or something, it came back as high oxidation. Yeah. Or sorry, fast oxidizer. And uh, I think you've said most people are slow. Is that correct? Um, it's a mixed bag. Some people tend to do fall more into the slow oxidation. I see that more definitely on a test. And the, the goal really is to shift between those. That's usually when you see the retracing. And a lot of people skip over retracing. And it just kind of means that you're kind of backtracking through all of the mineral patterns that kind of got you to where you're at, right? So like when you see these replacement theory um, HTMA people, they're just looking at low levels and trying to like boost that up. And from what I've gathered, that doesn't really seem to work. We kind of want to sometimes see the patterns get better, but a lot of times they get worse because you start dumping metals, you dump the excess calcium, and you need a practitioner who kind of understands those different patterns and the, how that happens. And, you know, I started in slow oxidation and then for the first few tests, I was in slow and then I went into fast and then I went back to slow and now I'm back in fast. So that's kind of a good sign that you're moving things around and you're switching. And then the program, like my HTMA protocol switches like every two months. And that to me makes a lot of sense because it's like, if you're taking something and it's actually moving the needle, then you got to adjust to the new program. And a lot of people are like, just feel good on zinc. It's kind of like when you go vegan, like you go vegan and like the first six months, you're like, yeah, I'm feeling great. And then over time, you just feel awful. That can kind of even happen in mineral balancing because you can give someone a program and they start feeling good. And then they go like, why would I retest? And then if they keep pushing it too far, then they'll actually start to feel worse on that program that was making them feel better because everything shifted and they're still on that first program. So the retesting and understanding the retracing is actually like a big critical component to doing mineral balancing. Mm. And retracing means... It's kind of like, like I said, like going back through those older, like mental and emotional and mineral patterns that kind of led you there because it's like, you didn't just wake up one day and have severe brain fog. Like you overlooked a lot of little, you know, warning signs, most likely that got you there. Like people are always like, well, I just woke up one day and I had all this uh, joint pain. And it's like, yeah, you probably ignored that you had ADD a little bit. You probably ignored a little hip pain and back pain because we're human and we just push through. And then there's something, whether it be emotional or physical, some acute situation that tends to, you know, overflow the bucket, as Dr. Pompa would say. And then you're like sitting there, like what happened? Kind of for me, that was mold. Like I, I moved away, got sober, was kind of decent. And then I moved into that house with mold and just collapsed within like a month. Like, cause I was already right there. And then that mold just took it to the next level, you know, probably reactivated the lime and the Epstein bar that I had. So you have, a, you've went through a lot of mineral patterns, whether you were taking minerals or not, just from the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, you know, dominance and the, all of the just life that we go through. We're these humans who are working these abnormal jobs and have, you know, shitty relationships and, you know, trauma bonds with things. So you go through different mineral patterns, whether you're actually on a program or not. And then at some point you reach that fatigue fatigue and that depression and gut dysfunction. And so you're going to retrace back through those. And sometimes that means flipping oxidation rates. Sometimes that means the, the you know, your thyroid ratio looks a little bit worse or, you know, and then you just adjust the program with that. And you got to have a practitioner who actually understands that just because the, the parameters on the tests look worse. That doesn't mean that you got worse. Sometimes people feel better when the stuff looks worse because it could be from heavy metals being released or toxic potassium being released, you know, a little bit of that excess calcium that was making them feel emotionally unstable, you know, whatever it is that they're releasing at the time is generally a good thing. But if a practitioner sees your calcium go way up, now they may say, oh, you don't need any more calcium. And that's just kind of false. They're not, they don't really understand how to read the test and balance everything at once. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's probably the biggest hurdle for someone to get over if uh, like to order these tests, I think, well, the, the, the main thing is <laughs> you can't just order this test from ARL or uh, these labs. You have to go through a practitioner. I think that's 
the first confusing part I see with a lot of people that ask me about it. And then the second one is you can't, you can kind of read it yourself, but I mean, I like ARL at the bottom, the mineral ratios, that's kind of easy to see where you're at. But as far as the levels, like that kind of takes some analysis, right? It's not just high or low and simple like that, like you said. Yeah. And especially in the beginning, because I always tell people, um, you kind of need to be on a program and do a retest for me to get a better gauge of where you're actually at. Because a lot of the heavy metals, they can prop up different levels on the test. And so if someone's not understanding that, they may think that you're okay in a certain department. Like a simple one that we use all the time is like phosphorus can be propped up by aluminum or other heavy metals. So that doesn't mean if so, if your phosphorus is perfect, but your aluminum's high, I may still think that your phosphorus is a little bit low and phosphorus is good for protein assimilation and digestion. So I want to see where that falls after you do another test or two, after you've been on a program for a little bit, and that's just one example. So it's not exactly just black and white, what it seems. And I did that in the beginning. I'm kind of kicking myself in the face. Um, when I was really sick and living in the mold house, I ordered a test from uh, Wendy Myers because I was listening to some of her shows and I, I liked the sound of the sounds of it. And I read it wrong myself and was like, oh, I don't see any heavy metals on here. I, I must be okay. Like maybe it's not the metals. And then now I know that when the metals are super low like that, it just means that your body doesn't have, you know, the adaptive reserves or the energy to actually release those. And you need to get on a program that's actually going to boost your energy. And then you'll see those come out over time. So I could have actually started this program and, and probably been a lot healthier because that was probably like four or five years ago, but whatever we live and we learn. <laughs> Have you seen with clients or heard stories of people doing a major life change, whether it's like a move, quitting their job, ending a relationship and seeing like a massive shift in their, in their test when they're not even on the program? Yeah, that's interesting. Sometimes like if people, they actually can get a little bit better. I just read a girl's test who she had an old test and interpreted, interpreted by somebody who didn't really know what they were doing. And she actually got better because she was in a four lows, which is like the most burnt out pattern. And she started doing meditation and breath work and really calming down and working out less. And she actually came out of four lows without even doing a program. So there's definitely aspects of just calming down and being more stable to just like improving something in general, because you already have the stress of the toxins in the system. So if you add on the extra layer of the environment, whether it's mold or a breakup or something like that, I can imagine that they're probably going to get worse. So I haven't seen anybody who specifically told me, Hey, this, you know, giant emotional issue just occurred in my life. And do you think this affects my, um, my ratios. And it's hard to tell anyways, because who knows if that mineral pattern in that burnout phase wasn't the cause for the emotional, you know, issue anyways, because it's really hard to have empathy and have good relationships when you don't have energy. You just can't show up in the way that you want to. I was like that. I'm very grateful that my wife even stayed with me. There was close calls during through all them treatments, like people see us and just think that it was all just like, we were just so in love that it didn't matter. Like, no, it, it, it mattered. I used to like to travel. I used to like to go out and go to concerts and do things. I was just like this shell of a person, like laying on the couch, half dead, just trying to make enough money to get by. And so I was showing up so I could pay my bills and stuff and, you know, working with clients and things, but really on the inside, I was dead. So I think sometimes the mineral pattern actually probably caused the emotional issue anyways, because something like high calcium or even the toxic metals are going to cause a lot of that inflammation and hardening. And you're just not going to be receptive to change or to working with a partner. So I think it's Dr. Pompa who says like 95% of a relationships uh, with someone has a chronic illness that they break up or they, you know, because it's just too hard on the person who doesn't understand. So somehow by the grace of God, I'm still with my wife and she stayed and that that's a blessing. That's awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> and I'm sure there's, there's cases where it could be the flip side where it can kind of bring clarity to people about their situation. I know in the past I've worked so many jobs that I was just miserable at, and you know, managers talking down to me or whatever. And as soon as I left, because I had enough energy to say, no, I'm not going to accept this treatment or whatever, this life, this lifestyle. Um, I felt like immediate shift in my, like 
energy continued to go up. So I don't know this, it could go kind of both ways, right. For a lot of people. Yeah. The, the calcium to magnesium ratio is called uh, um, the blood sugar ratio. And we can determine how well people tolerate carbs usually on that um, specifically because calcium is used for, to uh, secrete insulin within the pancreas, but then also the magnesium is to make sure that the uh, blood sugar doesn't get too low. So you don't have these giant swings, but also we look at that. And if it's in a certain range of too high, we will call that a lifestyle factor. And we tend to dig in with clients on, do you have like a job you hate, a relationship you hate? And so a lot of these are very physical phenomenons and we're looking at just basic minerals and vitamins, but a lot of the chart does really correlate with emotional patterns. And people tend to get pretty surprised when you, when you dig in with those and just kind of like leave an open-ended question and ask them like, do you have something, a job, like, you know, as simple as like a job you hate or like, how is your relationships? That can really like almost be triggering, but bring some clarity for some people because not everything's physical and it, some things are very emotional. Yeah. Are, are you a fan of the Dr. Wilson? I know uh, Clark often references Paul Eck, um, but I, I don't think I haven't found Paul Eck articles and Dr. Wilson's website is articles are really fascinating and they get so out there with like entities and stuff. They're really entertaining to read. Um, but I've, I've gleaned some interesting info from, from, I think I just read the nickel article, you know, since my, my test went back high nickel and I was, I thought it was interesting seeing what he had to say about high nickel. Uh, as far as Dr. Wilson, I've actually <laughs> spoken with, uh, Clark on this, on, on our first podcast, because it's tricky. You, you almost can't send his articles to your clients because, the where he go, I mean, everything, he's amazing. He's like the mineral balancing, like go, he took Dr. Paul X work and added in specific things like a little selenium, some TMG. He did the saunas and the coffee animus, things that weren't really around in the nutritional space because Dr. Paul X died in the nineties. So he's amazing. So if you can read through those articles and just gather the information without really attaching yourself to the cult like things that are I'm pretty out there. I don't really mind it, but I also just take it with a grain of salt because I don't know. He's talking about rogues and people being raped and they don't know about it and how coffee enemas can like keep entities off of you. So like you'll be reading this like really specific scientific uh, coffee enema article. And then like in the middle of it, it'll start talking about like entities and rogues and rapes and that can get a little bizarre for clients and and almost like cult like and there was actually a a big Instagram like fiasco that outbroke and was saying that HTMA was a cult and they were sharing a lot of these um there's always fiascos uh, on this yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> social media is a terrible place for for most people anyways but yeah like so he's great i just don't know like how sane he really is with a lot of that you know mm -hmm. it could be true maybe he's just like so mineral balanced and detox that he's like floating above everybody on planet earth and then there's like a big portion where maybe he's just like a little crazy and uh, all the practitioners that used to work with him that i'm close with uh, that have been in the game like 10 years they've all removed themselves from him so whatever he's got going on i'm not sure but his articles still are the best. I wish I could just send like those articles specifically to my clients because they're great, but then you're, they, you might turn people off by giving them that. So you have to be able to like detach and that's kind of a good thing just in society. I always say, you, you know, people look at social media and wars and different things going on. And when your nervous system is stressed, I think you attach to that stuff a little bit more politics yeah. and things. And when you balance out a little bit, like I can read a Dr. Wilson article and just gloss over something like that and say, whatever, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. And then just get the facts and the information from it. So I think he's great. He's done a lot for the space. He's moved this um, further than Dr. Paulette could have because he passed away in the nineties. And, but you do, you know, it does get a little cult like on his, on his uh, articles. I wonder if that's a sign of being somewhat more mineral balanced to be able to, you know, it's that idea of entertaining a thought without fully accepting it or, you know, not, not throwing out the baby with the bathwater, you know, when you look at someone's material, I mean, that's how I am now with all the guests I've interviewed. It's like, yeah, I don't agree with a lot of the guests I've had on my show anymore, but there are still nuggets in there of things that they talked about that are true. So it doesn't mean I have to discount a hundred percent and same thing with my information. And I don't know, that's how I see it now. It's like, don't th <laughs> people, when I post about a supplement, people always like tag Adam Bergstrom, you know, and they're like, <laughs> what do you think about this? I'm like, 
do you need validation <laughs> from an authority to have your beliefs? You know, <laughs> um, the human species has came a long way from intuitive thought, in my opinion. And they tend to really cling on to, I, I mean, maybe not me, maybe you, maybe one of these other health gurus. And they take like everything they say is gospel and really just hone in on it. And I think it's super unhealthy. And it also shows a level of like lack of discernment that you have. Like you don't have any authenticity or you don't have any thoughts. You're just parroting what this other guy said. And, you know, we had this discussion about like not agreeing with most of our guests and I'm, I'm the same way, you know, even when I did Morley's protocol, there was things that I did that he didn't like. And when I was on Jason's protocol, I took, you know, um, cod liver oil and B6 and things that he didn't like, you know what I mean? So if you don't have that level of like intuition and what feels right for you and haven't done the research around it, then I mean, maybe that's the problem. Maybe they're like only listening to one podcast and not gathering like enough information. Like me, I like like five or six different podcasts and then it's kind of hard. I used to listen to more. And then you realize once you have your own, you kind of like get, you know, vacuum suction into just like researching the guests that you're about to, to um, interview. So I used to listen to a lot more before I was doing mine consistently. Consistently, but I did take a lot of different information and then also applied that and tried it and seen whether or not I felt good. And that's just healthy, I think. Yeah, I agree. Um, hopefully you're fine. If we're hopefully you're okay with us jumping around a little bit, you mentioned uh, vitamin B6. And uh, I think in my genetic testing, it showed that genetically I have a higher requirement for B6. And that resonates with me when I supplement it, I feel amazing. And when I don't supplement it, I don't feel as good. <laughs> Um, I think I saw Dave Asprey made a reel like a month ago or something on the pyridoxine HCL, which is like the cheapest, uh, most common form and saying how 95% of it gets stuck in your tissues or something. And it's an inactive form. And uh, I know in your products, you have P5P, which I, I feel so much better on, which they call the active form. What, what's been your experience? Like, did you start with the pyridoxine form? So, um, luckily for me, um, my business partner had already had the first batch of NAK up out and the zinc and the magnesium forms weren't as good as what we have now, but he did switch the P5P and this is very controversial as well. And it gets into context and there's always a lot more going on than just B6 toxicity. So a lot of people do experience a lot of those symptoms of B B6 toxicity, um, when they take the paradoxine. But also zinc is required to actually convert paradoxine into P5P. Mm -hmm. So what we see just across the board is this kind of like subclinical or maybe clinical and people don't know zinc deficiency. And so, yes, mm -hmm. in the beginning, probably P5P would work better. But I, I wonder if people mineral balance for a while, for years, and then had adequate zinc if they could just take paradoxine with no issue. Like that's Clark's mm -hmm. case, I feel like. He he tends to think like, oh, once you detox everything, the forms don't matter. And I kind of disagree with that. And I think that a lot of people in the beginning, they're so toxic and they can't absorb things very well. And so it makes sense to just use better products and, you know, on, and stuff without fillers and coatings and things like that. So, you know, another one people don't uh, realize is retinal palmitate gets a lot of bad rap as well. And I know you've had a lot of shows around this. So I'd love to touch on it. Zinc's also required to convert the retinal palmitate into retinol. And also it's, it's the pancreatic enzymes are um, part of that process as well. And zinc helps regulate them. And we also give pancreatic enzymes on the program. So I'd love to touch on that in a bit as well, because mineral balancing isn't only minerals, as you've seen from like the supplement report, there's a lot more that goes into it, but just back to zinc and that. So there's a lot of things that we are expecting the liver to do that it's not doing simply because of something like a zinc deficiency or other mineral deficiencies in general, because one may be needed to convert something into the other. So it does make sense to use active forms of a lot of things, but also we're always giving that zinc and helping to bring that body into balance so that maybe they don't really need P5P forever or, you know, whatever. And it's, it's there and it's cheap. It doesn't matter. But yeah, a lot of these conversions need a healthy liver or healthy just glands in general to get the job done. And we're so far removed from that. And cofactors sounds like zinc's, zinc's so important. Yeah. I like the emphasis that's placed on the liver and kidneys, uh, hence saunas and coffee enemas. And I, uh, got off of coffee enemas for a while. Cause you get convinced it's easy where 
you know, it's just, I'm not sticking stuff up my butt. It's unnecessary. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> it, you know, just there's other ways to heal the liver. But when I got back into them after taking, I don't know, two, three years off, it was like, oh, wow, light bulb went off in my brain. Like I just felt way more clear. And uh, I got back on saunas recently with my wood burning sauna. And I think Robert Selig's thing is like minimum every other day. So if you don't want to do <laughs> coffee enema every day, which is pretty intense, just alternate coffee enema sauna, coffee enema sauna, which is still rigorous to me. I mean, it is, it, it's a job, but he makes the point like your health is worth it and you need to prioritize it, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't need to parrot his information. He, I think he hammered that home, but it, it is true. If that's one of the things that Dr. Wilson brought to the mineral balancing game. And it, it makes more sense because we're just so much more toxic. And honestly, there's like rodent studies that say like heavy metal toxicity actually can show up like generations later. So it's like, we've been toxic and been passing it down. And then now the environment has so much more. So this protocol is actually very, very difficult due to the level of toxicity that we have now in the modern era without the coffee enemas. You see it time and time again, people have skin rashes or, you know, they have all these crazy healing detox symptoms and you, you, you know, you message them, email them back. Like, are you doing the enemas? Like, pl like, please tell me you're doing the enemas because if not, the liver just gets super congested and we're trying to open those pathways as much as possible. And then I think after you balance, people don't want to hear this, but sometimes it takes two, three years, you know, to balance. I'm still detoxing pretty heavy and I've been in it for a while, you know, so it can go on for quite a bit. And I, I know I was way more toxic. My wife didn't have that same experience after maybe like six to eight months. She was pretty good, you know, small symptoms. So everybody's different. And obviously I was a lot more um sicker than everybody because I was out seeing all these doctors and everything. So I knew mine was going to be a little bit more challenging, but the enemas are definitely very much needed. People can be sensitive to them in the beginning. I try to say you can lower the caffeine, but make sure there's some caffeine in there because that's going to stimulate the bile. And I do two a day and I do the sauna almost every single day. It's just, I do them back to back. So it doesn't take like a whole bunch of time. I make them both and just hit them back to back. The first one kind of clears, clears everything out. And then I think the parasites are kind of smart and they, and they, they like shift away from that first one. And then sometimes you'll see them come out in that second one. So I think the first one kind of clears the pathway and then the second one gets out more of the gunk. And it's been bizarre, the amount of parasites I've released on this protocol. I just didn't even know a human being could actually harbor that many. Interesting. Well, yeah, I love uh, your episode with uh, so the Creatrix Solutions. I can't remember her name. Uh, Eileen. Eileen. Yeah, that was a great show. And that's if, if anyone's squeamish about it and just getting over the mental aspect, especially if you're male, I think is a, is a hurdle. I recommend listening to... Uh, to Matt's podcast with, with Eileen on, on coffee enemas. Cause once you understand the science of it and, and then you experience it, it's like, Oh wow, this is, um, this is really incredible. And especially after high dosing copper. And I, I think I was zinc deficient. Well, for like a lot of people, but specifically in my case, I just didn't like red meat growing up. I was like chicken nuggets you know, pizza, like you mentioned, mac cheese. It sounds like kind of similar. <laughs> I didn't really like burgers or steak. I didn't get into that until my 30s, really. Um, so I was probably just loading up on copper from basically a plant-based diet. Um, and so once I learned that you can dump quite a bit of copper through coffee enemas, I was sold just from that. Yeah, it does help with removing the copper. Also, I think a lot of people get it confused as far as like, well, I'm just going to take a whole bunch of zinc and that's going to eliminate the copper. And it doesn't really work like in just specific antagonisms like that, just because you see it on the wheel. Like if I just mega dose this one thing, this other thing will lower down. And it doesn't work like that because copper is actually, you need the adrenal hormones to be working correctly to actually get that ceruloplasm to work. I think that might be Morley's reasoning for the adrenal cocktails. I just think it's kind of in the wrong context. I don't think that those are actually healing the adrenals. You might, because we're not really looking at sodium and potassium in the diet when we're looking at the chart. We're actually looking at all aldosterone and then also more like cortisol, cortisone when we're looking at potassium. So it's like, that can get a little confusing too. I don't think it's 
these um, electrolyte powders are moving the needle on sodium and potassium in the chart. We just kind of pay attention to those for more th um, adrenal and thyroid function. But yeah, the the um, and so we see the copper doesn't really usually get released until much later on when we dump a lot of the heavy metals, because I think the heavy metals are causing the, the adrenals to shut down in the first place because they want to work all of your hormones and all of your glands. They want to work in the best capacity that they're able to, but then they just get overstressed. They get too toxic. And then the, the hormones aren't being secreted in the way that we want. And then we keep shifting the ratios back and forth until we try to get into balance. And then you dump a bunch of aluminum usually comes out first. It seems to be like the easiest one. Um, and then everything else tends to come later after that. And then you'll start to see that copper go up and down. And my guess is that you actually probably had that high copper probably because of the copper sulfate, which was weird because um, I remember I posted my results in, in Jason's group and I didn't have that. I, I just still had really low copper, like in like a poor eliminator style copper. So we had different experiences with that, which is interesting because I did it for a whole year. So I thought mine was going to be through the roof as well. And it wasn't. But then now your copper's still high. So I would guess that your copper probably came back down into like a more normal range or maybe even in a poor eliminator range. And then since you're dumping all these metals, whether that's through melatonin or whatever other mechanism that's going on, it may have came back up because copper will be released again. You know, you probably was high from the high dose, went back to a normal range. It's hard to tell because these are like two years apart. So you don't really yeah. know like what was going on in between. But if I had to guess, it came back down into normal range and now it's high again because you've released a bunch of these metals here and then copper will tend to come out with that. And melatonin is actually shown uh, clinically and in studies to actually um, chelate out copper. So it could just be from the melatonin in general what's keeping it high. Yeah, it's, that's fascinating. You, you said a few times uh, you mentioned toxic form of minerals and I wanted to touch on that um, because... I know in the supplement world, I mean, when you go to the supplement store, there's a million different chelated forms of vitamins and minerals that you can take because they have to be bound to something. Uh, but are what you're referring to usually, I guess it can be from supplements, but are you, when you say toxic forms of minerals, is that more coming from, like you said, uh, industrial pollution, you know, air, water, you know, uh, uh, NPK, fertilizer grown, you know, the produce, is that kind of what you're more referring to or, or is it like everything? I think it's somewhat of a mixed bag. Um, some of them I do think are from the environment. Manganese is in tap water. I think it's even used in like car, like gasoline, car exhaust. If you're like a guy who's, you know, handyman, been around a lot of car fumes or whatever, you can have that manganese. Um, obviously iron, I think just um, if Back to Morley being probably correct with your, you know, uh, iron recycling system not being correct. You can have those toxic forms of iron being built up. Um, copper clearly just doesn't get transported the right way when you have the heavy metals and the adrenals out of, out of function. And so we even look at chromium in that way. And what, what we call, we call those the amigos. So what they do is they get sequestered in the tissues altogether. And as you balance out the system, you can actually release toxic forms of minerals as well because they are beneficial and they're in the food and they're in supplements, but you know, just like anything else, calcium or whatever, if they build up and they're, you know, in the tissues and in the wrong places, then they'll cause dysfunction as well. And so you want to actually see manganese go up way over the reference range or the ideal level and come back down. You want to see iron do the same thing. And so it's interesting, you know, Morley always says like, you can only um, use blood donations to remove toxic forms of iron, but on the hair test, we actually see it kind of go up and down. So I'm wondering why, why would that happen? It, it has to be releasing some kind of toxic form of iron as well. And, you know, Clark's hammered this home a bunch of times about how aluminum affects that. And also zinc affects it because there are different enzymes that you need when, you know, when copper builds up and how zinc um, works in that whole system as well. So it's like, you're gonna see um, a lot of these toxic form of minerals come out. And I don't know if any other program does that, or at least I would need to see hair tests from somebody who's just doing high dose melatonin or who's just doing zeolites. Like I've had talk with my buddy, Jeff, who owns zeo charge and 
you know, we, I was like, maybe just taking a bunch of zeolite and melatonin and getting the metals out of the way. Maybe that does release excess, excess copper or excess manganese, because if the body's getting rid of the metals and it's balancing out more naturally, it's potential, but I don't have any proof of that. I, I'm not sure. You know, I would need to have Jeff doing a hair test every two months or someone like you who's on the melatonin doing hair test every few months and kind of see what shifts there. I'll be the guinea pig. I'll do it. <laughs> so, so when Matt said my two years apart, he was referring to my tests. Uh, my first HTMA I did, uh, what was it? November of 2022. And then my recent one was beginning of February of 2024. So that's not ideal. Uh, you're supposed to get a hair test. What is it? Every two or three months to kind of track your progress. And yeah, we usually tell people every three to four. Okay. It's pretty good. You know, if you're really doing the program like diligently, like I am, mine have changed every two months. Now, if you're taking the wrong supplements for one extra month, I don't think it's going to kill you. A lot of these deficiencies and excesses build up over years and years. So three months, I think is the best for like a client. But if you're really like someone trying to dial it in like me or you who really wants to shift it as quick as possible, I would say every two, but you know, anywhere from two to four for sure, because there's things like the sodium potassium ratio, you know, this is um, super interesting. I would have never thought that we would supplement zinc based on the sodium to potassium ratio, but that's just what happens. And uh, Dr. Paul, that kind of figured this out when he was had low zinc levels and then he felt worse when he was taking just zinc by itself. So then he had to go kind of back to the drawing board and look at some of these sodium synergists like copper and manganese and vitamin C that'll help raise the sodium. So he was like, okay, how can I still take zinc, but also bump up the sodium to potassium ratio? So then he formulated what was Lymcomin, and then now we've done NAK up and then that raises it. So that's one thing why you really need a test uh, specifically, because if you keep taking, if you had a high NAK ratio on a test, and I give you zinc and then that ratio flips and you keep taking zinc and it's lowering it further. People really feel that like, and then once you do the program for maybe like a year, you almost can tell when the ratio flips. So I'll always have like NAK up or why well, make the supplements so that helps. But even before I had the supplements, I would have both because if I started to feel really bad on just the zinc, I would try the NAK up even without a hair test. And if I felt a little perk in energy and felt better, I knew that maybe I, you can't tell if you switched oxidation rates or anything without a test, but you can play around with either the NAK up or zinc in mid between tests and go, oh, I probably lowered my ratio past that 2.5. And now I feel better on the NAK up. So let me just do a new retest and just see. And people start to get the feeling of that over time. In the beginning, it's a lot harder. You're doing, you know, you're having a lot of detox symptoms and you just don't feel well in general. But once you've been on the program for a while and you understand it a little bit, you can play around with that. <clears throat> do you find most people have a low sodium to potassium ratio? Like I'm sure you see patterns in the majority of clients that you work with. And um, it's my understanding that's a sign of like chronic stress that's low. I, low or high. Um, okay. I'd rather see it a little high than a little low. If it's a little high, people actually, it's a better sign of adrenal function back to being that sodium. Um, and they they tend to detox metals a little bit better. But then if it's super elevated, I'm looking at like, does this person have like some kind of autoimmune condition, severe inflammatory condition? Like there's no reason it should be super high either. But a little bit high is better than a little bit low. Anytime it's low, you start to feel off. You can have those like lethargic, depressed kind of feelings. And sometimes it just goes low because you're retracing too. Like that's what I'm in right now. Like I was taking NAK up and my, my NAK ratio, sodium to potassium ratio for people who don't know, got even lower when usually that's really good at boosting it back up. But it's because I did some retracing. I dumped some toxic forms of potassium and things like that. And then back to the, you know, that was one we didn't touch on, but yeah, usually the toxic form of potassium is what we call fertilizer. You know, they use the fertilizers, it gets in the food and then it builds up in the system and people think like, oh, well, I'm eating everything organic. Well, it's like, how long has that farm been organic? How long was it a, was it some fertilized farm before some dude decided to get on, get in on the organic trend and make it organic asparagus or whatever? It could have been some fertilized place for like 20 years. And then now it's been organic for like three. 
And it's still going to pick that up in the soil because you can't never rebuild the soil that fast and you're not going to rebuild it with a monocrop farming system anyway. So it's going to probably be there forever or until someone does some kind of like biodynamic or like regenerative thing to it. But yeah, the I don't think there's uh, one or the other. I've seen it both ways. People are either on zinc or NAK up and it flips as people, you know, shift around and move around. But I wouldn't say one's any more common than the other. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. So excited to have a year round garden now in my dome. I've been listening to Gary Matsuoka on YouTube. Thanks to Adam Bergstrom. And he's down in Southern California, like an older Asian guy. And he, he has really great free lectures on YouTube about gardening. And it's, uh, it's empowering to learn how to grow food, you know, <laughs> just something as simple as tomatoes or potatoes or <laughs> whatever. Uh, I've been spending a lot of time learning about that. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's great. That's the ultimate goal. You know, I think if uh, something the company does well and I have, you know, booked clients, you know, my future goal is some kind of uh, farm or whatever. It's, it's just definitely the move. And it's at least just, even if you just grow up for yourself, that, that little bit of freedom, that sovereignty, you know, I like what you're doing. Appreciate it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think my lowest ratio was calcium to potassium and it was like in the tank, almost zero. <laughs> Yeah. So when, um, <clears throat> when you're, that's your thyroid ratio, calcium to potassium, because um, the uh, potassium is used to synthesize the uh, cells to thyroid hormones. So that can be a bit of an issue just giving thyroid uh, medication, because if you don't know how permeable or non-permeable the cells are, so say someone has like yeah, um, their calcium's really messed up because calcium is actually used to stabilize the cell membrane. So when you're looking at the whole chart, if someone's uh, cells are actually super permeable and then you give them the thyroid hormone on top, they're actually going to, you know, they're going to take all of it up and actually probably feel worse. So there's like reasons why we don't really recommend thyroid hormone. If you're already on it, I would say like, wait until you balance out some, because I, I got off of mine probably about like four months into mineral balancing. I just felt like I wasn't feeling good on it. I don't know. I, I was, I was on it. What were you on? I was on the armor thyroid. Dr. Uh, Minkoff had me on that. So I did okay. stick with that for a little bit. Cause it gave me a little bit of energy in the beginning. And then I don't know, once I started mineral balancing, I was just like, I don't want to take this anymore, but yeah, that's how we get a good re uh, reading of your thyroid. And it can be a little confusing because when it's low, it actually means you have an overactive thyroid. So it's, it's opposite of what you would think. Hyper. And, yeah. So it's like hyperthyroid, but also your test can be a little skewed because you had that your potassium went up 700%. So I would like, if I had you on a program and I seen the potassium goes up 700%, I'm going to look at that more as a retracing than you actually have some severe hyperthyroid going on. You, that could, because that potassium is skewing that ratio. That makes you, sense. You get what I'm saying? It, yeah. it went up 700%. Yeah. It's a huge so, jump. Yeah. <laughs> so your calcium went down a little bit, which happens naturally in um, fast oxidizers. And so people don't get as well. That's the reason you can have copper toxicity and still get copper in a fast oxidation protocol is because that little bit of extra copper is actually going to help bump up the um, calcium and magnesium. So like people are like, well, well, you told me I had copper toxicity. Why do I, am I on this protocol that has like copper in the NAK up and copper in the SBF formula? And it's because we're always looking at what it does to balance the whole chart in general. We're trying to push you towards those ideal levels as much as possible. And even if you have, you know, calcification, I'm still going to give you some bioavailable calcium to balance out. If you have copper toxicity, there might be a chance where you still need copper, depending on your ratios and your oxidation rate, that's going to help balance you out because the bioavailable form is going to be used instantly and it's going to shift the ratios. And then over time, just by balancing everything out, then you'll release the metals, then you'll release the excess amigos and, you know, top irritant forms of the minerals. And so it can get a little confusing with clients when you're trying to explain this stuff and it gets deep in the weeds, but it's, it's much needed. Yeah. Why? Yeah, I think a lot of it is dispelling the myth that uh, certain nutrients are toxic always. Like, because um, I I think we both fell into that. You know, like mentioned like vitamin D and you know retinol palmitate or um, I whatever it is, iron, even food, uh, food, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not even just supplements, food. We still need all the elements right it's just like in a balance which is the whole thing I, I you touched on on calcium and i did want to talk about calcification uh because we we're talking about this off the air the other day 
And yeah, that's also another fear topic that I, I probably need to create some content around because I was just like everybody else in the else in the health field, uh, magnesium, magnesium, you know, uh, bicarbonate baths, uh, <laughs> you know, pills, you know, do it all every day or just, <laughs> but what about calcium? And I've been on dairy for years, you know, raw dairy, goat milk, a two raw milk, cow's milk, whatever. Um, do you think, uh, I guess to start it off, do you think dairy is enough for some people or do, do a lot of people need to actually supplement straight calcium? All right. It's a lo loaded question with calcification <laughs> because it's, it's all over the health space. So I'm glad you um, asked about it. And calcium is one of the main minerals that actually gets depleted very quickly from stress along with the magnesium and the zinc, right? So calcification and all the research you've actually done on it is very valid. But there's a lot of other causes that cause calcification besides just calcium intake. And there are some studies that show that some of the cheaper forms of calcium may cause calcification, especially like a lot of ones that don't use K2. And, you know, it's not just a K2 deficiency. You also need sodium and potassium, which is also not just electrolytes. That's like I said, back to the adrenal glands and, the, you know, the cortisol you need sodium and potassium in the right levels and ratios to keep calcium and magnesium in solution and in ionic form to be used by the body. So I actually think that's why Endomet's pyramid actually works. It's not the greatest forms of anything, but since we're working with the whole system as a whole, and then there that sodium and potassium as you're working with that keeps those in ionic forms, the body does actually end up being able to use those. And as we dump things like aluminum, we'll see that excess calcium come out. And calcium is super important. It's anabolic. It um, inhibits thyroid releasing hormone. It's really good for like muscles and nerve, especially in the brain. Like a lot, you know, calcium and aluminum have that antagonism, not just calcium and lead. You hear calcium and lead just get thrown around, but there's, there's also um, lead, cadmium, and aluminum. So you'll see the excess calcium come out with the aluminum a lot of times when you're dumping. In the body, this is, goes back to some of the genius of Dr. Paul Eck, the body likes calcium and magnesium to come in in a specific ratio. And we still actually cannot find out why he used that 1.6 to 1 because a lot of other places, even like the global healing I sent you, probably the one you're using, they all use 2 to 1, but he used 1.6 to 1. And so we stuck with that ratio with our new CalMag Fusion that's coming out. And it might make a little sense. Maybe we need that little extra magnesium, maybe because of the burn rate. I'm not sure. I have had some people that have used that two to one ratio of that global healing and have still done really great with that. So probably just because of the forms are better, in my opinion, in general. But um, I think a little extra magnesium will help. And calcium is just super needed and it, it. You have this like unlimited store of it. So your skeletal structure can get leached and keep the blood calcium where it wants to be. So you'll do a blood test and people will say, well, you don't have any calcium deficiency. And it's like the inflammation's causing the calcification, the heavy metals, you know, the vitamin D works with it. So there's a lot of nuance around calcium. And I think um, one of the biggest mistakes in the health community is actually just mega dosing magnesium. And I fell into that trap long, even before I heard you, I was taking all this by optimizers. I was taking all different forms, you know, jigsaw, I was taking as much magnesium as possible. And that's going to end up blocking calcium signaling over time. It's similar to like, you know, the high dose iodine or the high dose copper. It's like, well, for how long does that work? Because are you supposed to be taking that much of some element forever? At some point, something's going to shift and it's not going to work anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was great. So when you said 1.6 to 1, that's magnesium to calcium, right? The calcium will be higher. Yeah. Oh, the calcium the would be higher. Okay. So like All if right. you did like the, you know, what you're on is a two to one, it'll probably be like a 200 to 100 or sometimes it's like 90 to 45. It just depends on the dose of the brand, but yeah. Um, so there's a little bit more magnesium in ours than some of those two, two to one ratios. So I think that's probably valid as well. I think a lot of people probably do dump magnesium in, in today's age. And that's what Dr. Paul Eck used. And there's something to say about his ratios, right? Because how are so many people actually getting great results from this Indomet line, like from the nineties, like they're, they're super cheap forms. Anybody who's listened to a podcast or did a genetics test 
has a very hard time even taking them because they just look at the forms and the fillers and the coatings. And they're like, why would I take these? There's some level of genius and also trial and error that Dr. Paul Eck did that needs to be respected within the ratios, in my opinion. Mm. And what's interesting to me is like the competition for absorption. And I'm, I'm like an anti-liposomal guy. I think that's a marketing <laughs> scam especially with like vitamin C, it's totally not necessary according to the research on ascorbic acid. But uh, with calcium and magnesium coming in together, um, I, I'm i starting to research and I, and I want to look into it more like the absorption of them being the same form or I know we were talking about uh, orotate before we hit record. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the, uh, absorption and, and competition for absorption or... I think forms matter. I mean, if that's the question that you're asking, and that's the reason why we reformulated these and, you know, there's, is a general, you know, subset of people who actually don't do that well with endomed or they get like gradually better, but they never really release a bunch of metals or they never flip their sodium potassium ratio or their oxidation rate. And my business partner was one of them. He took Limcomen even sometimes at like 12 tablets a day. And he could never raise the sodium potassium ratio. Like he was on the program for like nine years. And it wasn't until he did the, the first version of NAK up that we created. He took that for six months and then finally his sodium potassium ratio flipped. So, and that was just with a change of P5P and then like the zinc, I think he didn't really change a whole lot in that first one. He just wanted to see like what the active form of the, um, of the B6 would do. And then I think the very first, I kind of forget, I think it was zinc picolinate or something. And uh, Endomet uses a lot of these amino acid chelates, which are kind of confusing as well. You have to kind of call the lab and see what that even means. Like what, you know, there's all kinds of chelates that it could be. What's that actually mean? So that's a little confusing too. But yeah, I think forms matter. And one one form that we landed on is the orotate, like you brought up. And Dr. Hans Napier, he has this book called The Curious Man that I think you would love because it's old school. And honestly, you should read it anyways because you have an orotate supplement. You have the lithium orotate. Um, and it's super cool. A uh, way he what he found is with his super ill patients, he basically couldn't find any mineral carriers um that basically could help his sick patients. And he kind of has been squashed and deemed like quackery, pretty much like everybody who does cancer research and actually does a good job at it. So that's why it's like a little bit harder to find his, his information, but he actually was from Germany. He even ended up uh, moving to New York and he was working with all these celebrities and different people. So they was really like sought after. And he actually died two years after Paul Eck. I think if the, if them two could have collabed, like if the internet was bigger and they maybe would have found each other's work, you know, it was like a lot harder back in the nineties to just do what we're doing right now. They probably would have found each other at some point. And oritic acid is actually found in, um, in breast milk and in whey protein. But what it is, it's, you know, it's a negatively charged ion carrier. So positively charged minerals such as calcium, magnesium, potassium, they actually have a little bit of a difficulty passing through the cell membrane because of the positive charge of the cell membrane as well. So they kind of repel like magnets. So when you actually link something like sodium uh, or not sodium, that one's harder to do. You actually can only find that at research labs. We looked for it, um, but potassium, calcium, and magnesium they actually have no affinity for the cell membrane and they'll actually get delivered right into the mitochondria and the cytosol where a lot of the minerals are needed for enzyme function and energy. So we actually have been getting great results with um, orotates. I've actually been making my own calcium orotate, magnesium orotate blend since November, like bulk supplements and different powders online. And I mean, it's just been fantastic. And that was my business partner who got me into that and got me into Dr. Hans Napier. And he had great, um, a lot of autoimmune conditions he fixed as well, not just cancer, a lot of pain and inflammation, you know, cause calcium is needed for the structure and, you know, a lot of back pain would go away and joint pain. So we love the orotates, potassium orotate he did really well with. So we've included those in most all of our formulas. Mm. Yeah, it's fascinating. I'm definitely gonna, gonna order that book and read it. Uh, yeah, orotate used to be called a vitamin, right? I think vitamin B13. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, it's I didn't know that. It's super underrated. Um, that's really cool. I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, lithium, uh, as you mentioned, that I sell, uh, it's super important for B, B12 utilization 
And I'm one of the people, I don't know how common it is that has a dysfunction there. So lithium for me is like, when I don't take it, I don't feel as good. And and I'm not taking me megadoses, you know, just 10, even 10 milligrams a day, it feels so much better. So yeah, I mean, you did have the high sodium on your chart and the high lithium, you know, I would maybe, like I said, it's up to you. You can do however you want. You're, 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 you're your own guy. You could pulse it, maybe do it once or twice a week. Um, you're in charge of your own health, but it could be the reason why the sodium raised also uh, high dose vitamin C can raise the sodium. And that's why it's in the NAK up and in the limb Coleman to help raise the sodium. So you could have raised it really high from those two supplements alone by taking higher doses than, than normal. But then also the potassium shot up so high that the sodium and potassium tend to, they're in, you know, relation to each other. So it might've just jumped up because of that and been like a retracing of the metals. Yeah. But I would think that the high dose vitamin C and also the lithium definitely had some effect on moving that up as well. Cause it went up crazy amount, went up a thousand per thousand percent <laughs> since two years ago. <laughs> yeah. With the vitamin C, I was, you know, getting heavy into Linus Pauling for a while. And now the way I take it is I, I pretty much just megadose it while I'm traveling, especially if I'm like flying all day and, you know, on layovers and stuff. Um, that's when I find it's really helpful for me just for EMFs and overall stress, but, uh, I'm not high dosing C every day anymore, just like on a regular dose. Um, I did want to talk about manganese cause that's something that's integral to think like limb come in right with, with endomet, but you guys also have it in your NAK up. Um, and that's, that's a really important mineral, right? For people to, to balance out. Yeah. It's one of the ones we definitely see build up. And we tell people, like I said, from the tap water, mm -hmm. but also it is that sodium synergist that we use in NAK up to kind of boost the sodium. So you can have like the, your manganese and like a poor eliminator fashion, similar to a heavy metal, where we know that you're not really releasing any of the toxic forms, but also want to give you that bioavailable form because the closer we can get that NAK ratio to, um, to that 2.5, then you'll release the excess. So yeah, we do have it in there. It's, it's, that's the thing. These elements are needed in bioavailable form sometimes, even if they can be toxic or you're holding on to the, to the toxic forms of it. You know, we didn't really get into the sodium potassium ratio, but you know, everyone talks about like the body electric and grounding and that sodium potassium ratio is actually a measure of your electrical potential across your cell walls. So, you know, a higher sodium potassium is a sodium with a higher electrical charge and a low one is actually like a discharging state, like a lower electrical potential between inside and outside of the cell. So there's a lot of factors that influence it, but we use things to raise it. So we use that as a sodium synergist to boost up the NAK ratio because the closer I can get you to having that better electrical charge, just the more balanced you'll be in general. Mm, that's awesome. Um, with your NAK up, what's the, the max that you've seen a client <laughs> take? Like, you know, I know you mentioned your business partner because on the bottle, it just says serving size one capsule and that's probably regulatory, right? Just for safety. <laughs> oh my God. You, you know, as well as I do that you gotta, you gotta weasel around with that. And then, um, um, uh, you know, have people sign a waiver, <laughs> yeah, that, like, you know, it's, it's with limb Coleman, the max dose is six. Hmm. Some people I was taking six, a day of our first version of NAK up, but it wasn't as strong as the updated, the, the, the second version. So uh, recently with that low NAK ratio, I've been taking five, but it has definitely caused some detox symptoms and reactions. I actually haven't took any minerals in like four days, which is another thing people don't get. Like if the detox starts to get too tough and you have things going on, say like this podcast, or, you know, you're going out of town, take a break. <laughs> And that's actually something I had to learn. You know, I was always like, push through, push through, but you do want to take a break sometimes. And yeah, I would say six is definitely max. And you probably don't even need that because if you're not testing, but every three months, then you may flip the ratio too fast, depending on how, how quickly it works. And we've seen that work pretty quickly. So someone like me, who's, who's a practitioner who can just send in a hair test every month or a month and a half, I'll play around with something like that, but I don't want to flip someone's ratio too fast in between because then they won't feel good on it. And it's hard for them to decipher whether or not that's just a detox reaction from moving around the metals or if the ratios flip, they don't really understand that enough. So I do try to like lower it. And this is also like 
where we're at in the stage of the game. This is why we are running out of products because we're changing formulas and changing things similar to what Dr. Paul Eck did, but not quite as hard. He started from scratch, but we are still playing with like, what do people need with these new forms? Is it less? Is it more like how, like how, like we don't know we're getting retests and we just launched all of these in November. So we're just now kind of getting retest in. So really we're playing around with it ourselves. Like we're, we're about to lower the P5P. We think some people may not be getting B6 toxic from it, but it is a detoxifying. It turns on a lot of enzymes in the brain and, you know, can cause a little bit more of a detox reaction for people. And since it is the active form, do they really need that much, especially if they're taking five or six a day, we could, so we're going to lower that and play and play around with it. So we might end up playing around with these formulas for the next couple of years which is like, now I realize why people never try to reformulate this stuff because it's like, who wants to reformulate everything? You lose out money on the labels you bought. And you know, it's, so it's kind of a headache, but I think we'll get it dialed in within a year or two and it'll, it'll be smooth sailing from there. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, I love the product and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting. Uh, I did want to touch on, on nickel. So on a hair test, you'll see like the, major minerals right like calcium magnesium sodium potassium and then iron copper manganese zinc chromium selenium phosphorus but then below often you'll see like toxic metals and then other minerals like molybdenum cobalt <laughs> boron um i think my nickel was the highest and then second highest <laughs> was aluminum and then mer mercury uh a little bit of mercury was coming out and i think you said nickels associated with uh, a lot of the time like depression and uh, suicidal thoughts. Uh, thank God I don't have either of those <laughs> maybe because everything I'm on, I feel generally okay. But, um, yeah, it's, I, I wonder where my nickel, uh, load came from. It's really interesting. Um, seed oils. So actually oh, they wow. used to use, um, mercury in seed oils, which is absolutely insane because I think that's probably the most toxic and the most hard uh, metal to even get out of people. But also I don't know if mercury just has an affinity for the hair. I think we're actually detoxing mercury and people similar to cadmium, even if we don't see the mercury move around. Now you're using melatonin, which does have a strong affinity for the brain. So you might be just pushing that mercury directly out into the hair. And that's why it's crazy high. But with nickel, it is an on additional minerals because it's needed by the body. I think it's found in some nuts. It's in the food supply for sure. But what similar to them other um, irritant forms, it'll build up. And this is we'll see this a lot in people who are really, really depressed and really suicidal. And it it is a wreck to come. I know you said you were having some symptoms, um, feeling a little off and lethargic when I feel like when that brain fog. And I associate it with like long COVID and. Who knows? I mean, there's so many variables that to ever pinpoint it on one thing, it's probably never 100% accurate, right? You can try to guess like why you're feeling how you're feeling. But. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. But both times I've dumped nickel, um, they came out with a lot of aluminum. So you have the aluminum high on here. So both times I had a little bit of a higher of aluminum dump. I also had that nickel and it definitely felt like it was all in the brain. I don't know if it's coming from the brain or it just causes severe brain fog as it gets moved around, but it's like, you almost feel like you can't push through. You're like, dude, I just need a nap. Like I, like I need a, I need a new calm. Like I need something. I need anything PMF session with a new calm, something it's pretty bizarre when it comes out. But, um, and that's pretty much the case for everybody when you see the nickel move up, but it is, associated with that suicide and depression. And a lot of people, when they release the nickel, they actually see friends, family members, whatever close relationships you have, you actually are like no longer are attached to them. There's something to do with that nickel. Dr. Wilson talks about is like, it keeps you like attached to a little bit of a low vibration relationships almost. And then once you release it, you kind of view them people differently. Like, Oh, I I'm really giving this person a little bit too much of my energy or a little bit too much respect when they don't deserve it. And we all try to be emotionally stable and have love for people that are around us, but it's bizarre that it could just be some mineral that's actually keeping you attached to this low level state or this low level um, relationship that you know you shouldn't really be in and that's not really that good for you and actually energy draining for you. So you can just like one day dump a bunch of nickel and like walk out of your job like my business partner did or, or just like break up with somebody. But also 
that can happen with a lot of metals too. You can make irrational decisions. That's another reason why I say like, do the enemas, try to get into a sauna and back off if it's too strong, because you cannot be forgiven for the things that you do or say when you're moving all of this stuff around. And then I've even thought about having like a, a my, my wife is a life coach and she's obviously dealt with my chronic, um, illness thing. I almost thought about setting up like calls with her for like the loved one or like the family members, because maybe she could help them like kind of find some balance with them while they're just like super dead or where they're a little aggressive or they're just, you know, cause you can have mood swings, energy swings. You can come off as just very, you know, kind of like rage almost like you get mad over one little thing being messed up when all this stuff's moving around. And the family members need to know what's going on, you know, because they they don't understand it. They've never been through it. And then, you know, maybe forgive them for some of the things they say, but also, you know, maybe back off the program because you might end some kind of relationship that's very meaningful to you. So it sounds like it's how fast you want to go uh, <laughs> can determine how turbulent it can be, right? So... Yeah. And so there's like a group of people, you know, I talked with Clark about this, that, that think that they want to do this program with zero symptoms. It's impossible. Some of the things are lodged in your organs and tissues and, and, you know, even worse, your brain. You think if you're moving around a bunch of stuff in your brain, you're just going to feel like this optimal person who just want, is happy, go lucky all day. It's just impossible. At least for right now, maybe some alien will come down and f- show us some way to, you know, get everything out of our body all at once with no issues. But until then, you're going to go through it. And so there's a, there's like a balance, right? Like you are going to have to push through some, but also don't let it get so severe and get too like into your ego that you think that you should just push through everything because you're just going to be kind of dead. So you can lower the dose of something like kelp can be very stimulating. Like maybe just back off that for a minute, see if you feel a little bit better, lower the dose of the NAK up, you know, there's things you can play around with or just come off of everything completely. Like, you know, I actually am feeling pretty good. Like I didn't know that I would even feel this good after being like five days off of everything because I was feeling so awful the last like month. And I'm like, oh, okay. Actually, if I wasn't detoxing, I feel generally pretty good. And so there's like levels to, and also Dr. Paul like recommends that because it helps when you're moving so much around to take a break from the program allows the the body chemistry to, to kind of balance out. Kind of like I was telling you with the melatonin, like, Hey, mm-hmm. if you're feeling that crazy and everything's moving around this hard, maybe just take a break, like take a little bit less of that melatonin and then give yourself body, your body time to balance out and then go back on the melatonin and see how you feel. Just similar to what we kind of preach in mineral balancing. I think some people like take it, like, we're just like, you always got to push through like this masculine energy. And it's kind of not that, but it is a little bit of that because it's not going to be super comfortable all the time. You're definitely going to push out of your comfort zone, but also be able to find that balance where you can actually like have a nor- somewhat of a normal life while you're going through it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I feel pretty in tune with myself, especially when I'm alone and in my own thoughts, I feel like my intuition knows, you know, what supplements to take and when to go harder and when to, you know, back off. And so- <laughs> I don't know. Uh, You did talk about zeolite earlier. Is that something? um, So you've you've got uh, your friend that you interviewed of zero charge. You got me on that. And it's funny because I know the nano zeolite, like the liquid stuff uh, is really popular. I mean, I've seen it the last three or four years. uh, And he he educates like his YouTube videos are awesome. I want to have him on the show that it's nano can be harsher than the bigger particle size, right? And then also taking less intensifies the detox symptoms versus taking more, which to me is counterintuitive. (laughs) You would think taking a larger dose, like 20 grams would be way more intense than just taking a small amount, but it's actually, that's the case. Yeah. A couple of things I'll state about that is one, I don't put all my clients on zeolite it ends up being kind of expensive. They're already taking like seven supplements three times a day. And, it's you know, pricey. if I only had, if I only, yeah, it does, you know, if you only had to choose one, I'm going to say mineral balancing. Right. But Jeff's got great results with just this Zeo charge. And I don't think anyone in the industry understands Zeolite in Jeff's fashion. Like I've had tons of hour long conversations with him about this. Like I was totally swore off of binders for, for years. Cause when I was sick, I was taking all kinds of stuff. Right. 
the nanos, the, you know, bit night clays, charcoals. I was trying all this stuff. And so I swore off of those. I was like, there's, you know, your body can heal itself and push this stuff out somehow, some way. And then I, you know, got introduced to Jeff and he's kind of like this hidden gym. He doesn't really care to use. He has like one post on social media or something, got like 20 followers. Like he does not care. <clears throat> and he just makes like these blog posts from his house. And he's created a lot of different supplements that people don't know about. He's had other companies and he had a biohacking facility. And he's like, when you talk to him about like PMF tech and stuff like that, he can go really deep in the weeds. Like he's a, just the gem of knowledge. I'd lean on him for a lot actually, but he, you know, he uses the Oligo scan, which I can't really create a nutrition program from the Oligo scan, but I do like it. Cause it like, you know, like I said, when you have these poor eliminators on the hair test, like, a, like I have cadmium, well, I'll have really high cadmium on the Oligo scan. And I'm like, okay, cool. So it's a poor eliminator on the hair test, but then I do have it on the Lego scan. It makes total sense, right? So I like the Lego scan for some things, but no one's really done what Dr. Paul Eck has like around building a nutrition, like, like supplement program from the Lego scan. They just kind of like say, oh, take more iodine if your iodine's low and, you know, take the zeolite if you have high metals, things like that. But this zeo charge is actually insane because people don't realize like when you say 20 grams, like they don't realize like, a uh, normal liquid zeolite dose is something like 600 micrograms. <laughs> so like once you start getting into these higher doses, you're talking like hundred thousand times the amount of what people think. And what Jeff's found is there's like a dosing paradox in the zeolite like community. Basically those small amounts of zeolite, they actually just stir up a lot of things. And that's why people feel worse on them. They break open biofilms and there's not enough to grab onto. It's so zeolite is super interesting because it'll grab onto something like a heavy metal, but then it'll release that heavy metal wherever it feels like and grab onto some other toxic element and, or maybe another heavy metal. So like it can just like grab lead over here. And then when it wants something else, it'll just throw that lead wherever, wherever it's at in your body and grab something else. So the dosing paradox is interesting. And it's one of the only things that I actually recommend mega dosing probably besides melatonin. Like those are my two things that I would say you really, like I'm not into IVs, especially after learning all the interactions with the minerals. I'm not into the high dose copper iodine, but the two things that I do like with mega dosing is zeolite and melatonin. I think they're actually effective that way. And um, the zeolite, he found that if he gave someone like two scoops, which is still an insane amount for compared to like the microgram stuff, that's 10 grams. So each scoop is a five grams. He found that if he gave them another two scoops, they would actually feel better. And he's like, so why is that? And he's like, it's because the zeolite is actually going to drop a mineral, you know, or a metal that it's grabbed onto and grab something else. So you have to have enough in the system mm -hmm. to grab onto everything that it drops and it loses. And then he, so it has enough to grab everything that it's willing to grab. And he's still also in the, he loves, he tried mineral balancing for a bit and, and felt kind of awful. And he's, he's going to try it again. He actually was surprised that it, it actually did something. Um, and so he realized that, oh, get the, you need the higher dose, but also it can still take years even on the zeolite because he's like, the body doesn't just want to release things. People think zeolite just goes in like a key later and grabs everything. Not, not really. The body will dump as it feels feels basically safe to let go of that metal. So you can keep taking zeolite and sometimes it might not really have good effects for like six months. You might feel a little bit better or a little bit worse. But with the Aligo scan, he likes the metals to move back and forth similar to HGMA. Like some people just want to see the metals go down on, on a Lego scan, but he actually says that means you're not really getting it out of the organs and out of the storage. It should be like HGMA where it goes up and down until it finally settles on the lower end. And he's just a great, I mean, people detox, like he's got kids with autism and stuff who are on like six, 10 scoops of that stuff a day. And they have way less like autistic flare ups and things like that. And it's just a great product. A lot of people aren't going to do seven supplements three times a day, you know, like the mineral balancing stuff. It's a bit of commitment and the coffee enemas and all of that. So if no one's willing to do that, I, you know, I have an ad for his zeolite on my show with a discount. I, I love his product. And I think that that's a good move. I don't know if it will get because of how we know the mineral and metal interactions, if it'll get everything, but maybe over time, you know, maybe the body does start to release over time and it works that way. We have a lot of conversations like this, like, will it just happen over time and have less of that like harsh detox reaction that you get from mineral balancing that's like pushing. So like what I'm doing with mineral balancing and the zeolite to me is like an ultimate push catch.
So like how kind of like yeah. Quicksilver is doing push yeah. catch at like this little low dose thing. Like the mineral balancing is super strong, definitely pushing. You're going to feel it. And then the zeolite's grabbing it up at night. And I like to take it at night because I think you're more in like a parasympathetic state when you're winding down and you do more detoxing throughout the night anyway. So it makes more sense to me to take it, but some people take it in the morning and feel really good. But yeah, I only recommend that to clients if they do ask me if I, if I like a binder, because if you start telling someone like, Oh, Hey, you got to pay me. And then you got to pay for all the supplements. And then now you got to spend another 200 and something dollars. Like say they're on four scoops and it's like 60 bucks a tub. Now it's like another 240. So that's a really uh client who's trying to get after it. And it's a lot to ask of them. So I only recommend that binder if someone actually asked me, but I think it's the only binder worth taking on the market. Wow. Yeah. It's, that's interesting. So is it, is it catching minerals that are free floating in the blood and then binding to them? Cause it's not just binding in the intestinal tract, right? It's you're absorbing it into the blood. It's binding to it. And then you're peeing it out or whatever, or defecating it out. Correct. And it actually has minerals within the cage like structure. So it's actually swapping some minerals for those heavy metals. So kind of like in the ionic mimicry world, that Zeo charge actually has infused minerals in it. So it actually has the mineral your body prefers. So say it has calcium in the cage and it comes across that lead, it'll swap those, right? So that's actually good because you don't want to just yanking everything out. And I mean, at least as far as the Oligo scan, uh, he hasn't seen any like negative impacts on mineral levels on that. If anything, you see more of a balancing act because of the minerals that are in it and swapping for the metals and getting, and it's good for mold and all of these things. It's, it's, it grabs microplastics. And I think these are a lot of these elements that you're just not going to get out of your system. You're never going to have zero glyphosate in your system. So it's kind of like for me, like that daily exposure I'm going to use that zeolite and then the mineral balancing going to get deep into the brain tissue and get deep into the organs and use that. And so I like to use both and I haven't seen any negative impact on the hair test or the Oligo scan. So that's been kind of cool. I like what you said, the ultimate push catch. I never tried <laughs> that because it was so expensive. And uh, yeah, it was just a bunch of things to take. Is the Oligo scan, is that like a biofeedback, like where you put your finger on the metal thing, or am I thinking of something different? Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of similar to HTMA because, you know, in HTMA, they take the hair sample and they burn it. And then all of the minerals and toxic metals, uh, create like a wavelength of light that they measure. Well, this is what's it called? Like mass spectrometry or something. I think it's called something like that. Yeah. Something, whatever it is, I can never say the word, right. But you basically use light to measure four different points on your palm oh, and it'll basically show you what's in the tissue. And then that can change, you know, like most people just want to see, like I said, see that go down, but we like to see it fluctuate. And it's cool because it does show like when I dumped mercury on my hair test, I actually seen my vitamin D shoot up on the Oligo scan, which we know mercury can inhibit, like, you know, how you regulate vitamin D. So that was cool to see. It does show iodine on there. I'm not sure exactly how accurate it is, but that's kind of cool because maybe you... Uh, I'm thinking about bumping up my iodine a little bit because it's still low on there. And I've been taking the kelp for a long time. So there's little things like that Flu fluorides on there. I don't hold a lot of weight to all the metabolism ratios and things. I just look at the raw data of like, where are the minerals at? Where are the uh, metals at? One thing that's cool is you see mercury and silver kind of fluctuate together on that Oligo scan. And Jeff's like, you know, what is a silver filling? it's mercury and silver. So wow. you see them kind of go back and forth together and you're like, wow, that's kind of insane because that's basically what was off gassing into your brain. And now you're moving that around. So it's pretty wow. cool. It's just another like additive device, right? If you have someone in your area who's doing it for you, it costs like 175 to upwards of 250, depending on your practitioner for a test, but you do get the results in, in 10 seconds. So like, if you're there and you want to grab, like you get it immediately. It's not like you wait two weeks for an HTMA or whatever. Mine so took it's, a month. It's, <laughs> we won't even go what, what, what happened on yours. <laughs> That's insane. Do you still put any weight into blood tests? Like uh, as far as vitamin D or ferritin, like you personally, do you, do you, th do you get blood work done? I just don't like. You know, I know it's a biohacker way, you know, they get all these markers done and I've done, done that in the past with uh, inside tracker and different things, but I don't know, after donating blood a few times, <laughs> I mean, that's a much bigger gauge needle, but I just don't like getting stuck. You know, I don't, 
get IV. Maybe it's once a year or less I get an IV treatment. Um, it, uh, that's why I like HTMA. It's so non-invasive, right? Yeah, I mean, the blood test is interesting because the HTMA world will say, say that it's just like a snapshot in time. And there's so many things that can affect your blood. You know, if you had alcohol the night before, what was your sleep like? Like the blood's always trying to find homeostasis. So it's always going to have these regulatory mechanisms that want to keep it because if the blood's not clean, then basically you're going to die. Like the blood is like, it's your, your lifeblood. They call it that for a reason. And so you can have some skewed measurements on there. And I kind of got, I do get blood work once every, you know, maybe once a year, every year and a half, like just some pretty basic things to just see. But, you know, when I had all these symptoms, I had all this reg regular blood work. Like I had like a tiny high iron, like my, my Dr. Joel Roslin read my blood work and matched it across my genetics. And then my iron was a little high. Like that was it. Everyone else was kind of like, you're pretty good. And, you know, that's why I was in the doctor. I didn't even bring this up. Like I was getting CAT scans and MRIs. Like I was like, I don't care if they tell me I have cancer or like a tumor or something, just tell me something. And then I can research that and try to fight it. How, you know, with whatever, a keto diet or something. I don't know. Like, I was just like, tell me anything. But everyone just kept telling me that I, I was good. And, you know, I would get sunlight every day and I would eat really clean. So to them, I looked like this normal guy who was like making shit up. And I'm like, dude, I feel like I cannot think like my brain does not work. And so I haven't held a lot of weight. I know that the iron, you haven't held a lot of weight in the blood, blood draws, you know, blood work. It's cool to see, see where you're at, but I know iron is a better marker in blood. I still think that I would mineral balance for a couple of years and kind of get rid of that aluminum and lead that's affecting the iron markers before I just went on and got a iron transfusion or took iron supplements. And, you know, iron's in the diet. If you're eating like we do with the red meat, I think you're getting iron. And I think sometimes even that anemia might be caused by just, you know, the dysregulation of, of the minerals as well. So I would you know, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to put you on iron supplements anyways. And we don't really use those. I would like to see you balance out over time before just rushing into an iron supplement that a lot of people have trouble with. You know, a lot of people do great on it, but a lot of people feel awful when they take it. So I caution against that in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I had a uh, Caitlin Hardigan on for, with the iron protocol and she gets a lot of the RCP people that were, you know, <laughs> single digit ferritin coming to her almost dead. And <laughs> um, she gets her on, on heme iron supplement and uh, a lot of the time or iron bisglycinate, whatever they can do, but it's never comfortable, you know, people taking iron. It's always, yeah. uh, not nausea or there's, uh, it's not a fun experience. <laughs> so it's yeah. I never tried it cause I just eat so much red meat, but I, yeah, I want to see the ratios and the metals get moved out of the way. And then like, that's a lot like what I say about most everything. Well, maybe mineral balance doesn't fix everything, but how would you really know what your diagnosis is when you're full of toxic metals? Well, let's move those out of the way for a couple of years and then see if you still have those symptoms. Most people don't, if they really stick to the program for two to three years. And then if you do, maybe then it's time to really rethink what's going on here. But I'm sure you're going to still get gradually better because by moving the metals out of the way, you're naturally going to feel somewhat better. And then maybe attack something you have going on with like a herbal protocol or something else. You know, we're getting very toxic in today's world. So I'm not going to act like mineral balancing is the end all be all for everybody. That's why I use the zeolite. That's why I like, you know, spirulina and chlorella. And I like taurine. There's a lot going on compared to what was going on in the past, but also why we're updating the supplements. So we're hoping that with the better forms and the better absorption, maybe that'll work better for people in the toxic era that we're in now. And the emotional stuff, right? Like we touched on a little bit. I mean, not being raised with a mom or, or dad, one or the other. And then just that's a whole wild card. I feel like that people have to individually figure out, you know, <laughs> it just really, even their job. Like, it's like, how often do you think someone loves their job? I'd say about 2%. Like how many people do you think really get up and go to a nine to five and love it? There's so much fluff in that nine to five. That's why when everyone started working from home and COVID, they never went back to the office because they're like, I can do my 40 hours worth of work in two hours a day because the rest of your office time is fluff and, you know, looking at Facebook and doing whatever. So they're kind of just contained. You can't get much done 
when you're working 40 to 50 hours a week in some office, spending an hour in traffic, I see people in Tampa all the time. They're like hour of traffic at work all day, hour of traffic home. Like, I know you're not eating well, you're probably barely doing your laundry. Like, I'm like it's, it's <laughs> tough. And so the emotional part co- does come a lot from the toxicity, but also just the unsatisfactory jobs that we have in, in America yeah, or anywhere, I guess, across the world, probably. The artificial intelligence stuff is is a little uh, concerning, but at the same time, like I, I saw the Tesla bot in person recently, <laughs> and I don't know when that's going to come to fruition. I mean, it looks scary. It's like the face is all black, but you know, I was raised on Star Wars and C-3PO and R2-D2, and it's like, if they don't kill us, I feel like having one of those to do menial jobs, you know, I mean, what, every Walmart already has self-checkout in a lot of these stores. <laughs> I think that's that's a good thing. I mean, who wants to be a cashier doing that all day? I mean, I'd say 80% of the ones I interact with don't want to be there. I mean, that's the vibe I get. But... Yeah, it's it's like this <laughs> thing where we we always get scatterbrained about new technology. Like it's the internet's going to steal jobs. Like every time something evolves, we think that it's going to like collapse human society. And it usually doesn't. And I'm hoping that if less people are working those jobs, it forces you to be somewhat creative, you know, design a product, I don't know, be an artist, do something that you're a little bit more fulfilled in because they get really comfortable and trapped in those jobs. Maybe if you snatch that away, it's a little bit, little dose of tough love, but maybe they figure out something that's more meaningful. I don't know if you're like knitting sweaters and selling it on Etsy, like anything's better than being at like Walmart all day where you hate it. You're under the led lights. You feel awful. There's, the people of Walmart are terrible who are in there. Like everything's bad. So, I mean, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, uh, you want to jump into that? Some Q and a questions, Matt, we have a bunch yeah. here. Yeah. We can see, see what we got. I'll try to do, do any justice that I can. Kind of a, a broad one here. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen if you just eat well and aren't paying attention to mineral ratios? Um. So like what I think we've, kind of find in general is, you know, back to that, how that metal toxicity can kind of show itself generations later is that I don't really think that diet alone is enough for some people. It is like, I've talked to Dr. Tyler Panzer on my show about this and epigenetics, you know, and the reason like everyone totes epigenetics and they're just talking about like do keto or do paleo and cut out all these foods. I don't think that's really enough. It wasn't enough for me. It wasn't enough for my wife or anybody that I've put on mineral balancing. Not a lot of them have done a lot of diets or paleo or eating only sourdough bread or, you know, raw dairy. They've tried kind of all that. And so <clears throat> there is a part of the population that have lucked out and they're just going to get by with like, they change their diet and like every autoimmune condition goes away and they heal their gut and they feel pretty good. But it's like, are the toxins still going to build up? And maybe it presents itself when it's like 50 or 60. So I kind of feel like I'm lucky that I kind of shattered at like 30, 31, because I knew that that wasn't normal. But if you start to get the ADHD and a little bit of brain fog when you're 60, you might just call it aging. And I don't really think that that's going to be good either, because you should want to be healthy, whole and complete until you age. So eating just a healthy diet, if you've never been exposed to anything is solid, but it's probably a very small percentage of the population. I mean, you can just look at your chart, you live off grid, you buy the best of whatever you want. You have your own supplement company and every metal on the whole chart's coming out. Right. So people don't realize that like, just because they've been eating healthy for the last five, seven, 10 years, like what happened in what your mom, your grandma, like what were they exposed to? And that all gets passed. And then we're starting to see more kids than ever with cancer. You know, know, I'm working with a client right now. She was never vaccinated as a kid. She grew up with like a hippie mom holistically, didn't vaccinate her kids. Like her kids didn't even have processed food for two years. Like they were at like a birthday party and finally got like some processed food. And they have tons of health problems. Like I have them on mineral balancing protocols, right? So it's like, we can try to be contained and being healthy as possible, but it just shows up in the food system. It shows up in the air we breathe and it ends up even in organic food. So we're getting into this like time where it's a lot harder to just focus on diet and really be able to detox at least. Yeah. I mean, like you said earlier, the car exhaust, I mean, when you, (laughs) I think when I was raw vegan, there were all these memes and charts of, uh, you know, aluminum and in, in uh, 
make makeup products or or lead and lipstick and i mean the feminine care products and tampons and then uh i mean the exposure is just from every angle right the shower water the drinking water <laughs> the fertilizer everywhere think, yep it's a you i i personally don't think that you can you know maybe i'm a little biased because i you know got so sick so early but, you know, when you look at even Alzheimer's and a lot of these um, neurodegenerative diseases, a lot of them get linked back to heavy metals. It's almost pretty bizarre how you can trace anything back to a heavy metal. Like there, there is some scientific data for almost every diagnosis that can be linked back to a heavy metal. Now, whether or not that's the actual cause is up for discussion, but there are links to almost everything, you know, OCD, anxiety, ADHD, ADD you know, iron metabolism, like you can find the resources for it if you dig through the weeds. And so it's like, for me, it's like, why keep those in your system? They're just such systemic toxicants and they cause so many downstream effects. You should be trying to protect yourself from those at all costs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see thoughts on getting minerals transdermally. Like I know you mentioned iodine. I did the Lugol's for a while on the skin. Yeah. The only one that I've really ever did was the copper. I've never really, I don't know. Some people are totally against taking capsules. I'm not sure. I've always done pretty well. Like I know all of yours are capsules. You're probably in the same boat. Mm -hmm. I never really found any issue with, um, with like digesting and getting nutrients just from capsules. So I've never played around with a lot of the magnesium. I've done like Epsom salt bass. You feel good. I'm sure there's definitely some validity there. But then it's also like, how much did you absorb? What's the dosage? You know, we like to play around with like specific dosaging um, and a mineral balancing protocol. So I wouldn't know, like, you know, I started to think differently even about like float tanks recently. Cause I like, I used to like to float and now I'm doing the mineral balancing stuff. I'm like, well, will, will I get too much magnesium? Will that put too much magnesium in my hair when I do a hair sample, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't get into the body, like maybe it just hangs around in the hair for a week or something. So I've kind of like, skew now i'm like oh, how, how, man i like to love how i felt after i did a float tank but i know there's tons of magnesium in there and i don't know like how that will affect calcium it. powder no <laughs> <laughs> calcium orotate <laughs> put a bunch of calcium orotate in the float pod <laughs> no it's a good point yeah it's something i was thinking about the other day is that because yeah i think the mental emotional spiritual benefits of floating alone like besides any of the physical stuff is worth it to me just to check out for an hour. It's, it's insanely beneficial the way you feel for sure. Uh, maybe once I balance out more and I detox a bunch of the metals, I'll start playing around with that. Cause I do consistent hair testing and see if it, you know, affects anything. Well, it's a good point you bring up about, uh, magnesium affecting the hair test. And I think there's instructions like you just sent me one. I'm going to retest soon. You want to wait after you shower. What is it? How many hours before you uh, I can't remember exactly. I usually wash my hair like the night before, like in the okay. shower at night and then do the test in the morning. And okay. that's usually good. But I think there's a specific amount of hours that it does detail you on the test. You want to wait a little bit and some zinc shampoos can, uh, can, uh, can skew the zinc number as well. So you want to, I mean, most people listening to this are probably, you know, I use pig lard in my hair. One of the Morley Robbins things that I took from him, but I do love that. But you know, most people listening to your show are probably already being pretty natural. They're probably not using Selsun blue. So there's probably not a big, yeah. but I think some female products, cause they, you know, they use more stuff than we do. You know, they try to keep their hair a lot nicer and everything. So I think you have to be careful with some of the female products on the zinc, but yeah, I, I don't know. I just was kind of, you know, throwing that question around about the float tank with my business partner. And we just, we really didn't have an answer. It's an interesting one. Yeah. And uh, one thing I wanted to ask you earlier is cut. Like if you're taking your own hair, just by yourself. Um, like they say, you know, nape of the neck, or you could use pubic hair. But I think people I've interviewed, forget if it was Robert or Clark or someone, said it's not as accurate as hair on your head. Is that is that what you, you believe to be the case? Or Yeah, I mean, if someone's completely bald and has no beard hair, I mean, I'd probably rather do some sample than no sample. Oh, but, but yeah, that has the beard hair. Yeah, the beard hair is actually the second best because it's growing at kind of the same rate as the hair and it's closest to the hair. So you could do your beard, you would probably have to grow it out and then shave it afterwards because it'd be a giant patch in your beard. But um, yeah, I like the hair. You want it to be like an inch, inch and a half closest to the scalp. And this is more important for females because they don't, they have to realize they have to cut it 
really close to the head and then just get that little end piece because I don't want the end of your hair. It's that's been growing out for like three years. That's not going to show me like the newest mineral pattern. So you want it really close to the scalp. If you don't have your balding, you can use your beard and you can, I think that people send in armpit hair or pubic hair. It's just a little bit less of an accurate reading, but I mean, you could still just look at the ratios and try to do a supplement program from it for sure. And it's less accurate. Why? Just because it's further from your head. I think uh, Clark said something about the rate at which the hair on the head and the beard grow is different. And it, it makes sense, right? Your pubic hair definitely grows at a, a slower rate or different rate than the way your hair does. So it's about the rate uh, that it grows, you know, Interesting. Over, over time cycles. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. And for listeners, just to picture it, that you basically get like a little weight that you make on the table, like a little paper thing, and then you place the hair on it until it tips the scale. And then that's how you know how much to send in. You put it in an envelope. It's super easy. It's it's way easier than getting a blood test. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, you know, for women kind of say sometimes like, what about my hair? And, you know, my wife's been doing it like every two months for like over a year. And she, you can't even tell that she clips some of her hair off. You know what I mean? And guys who have shorter hair, it's pretty easy. You just, I just do it the day that I'm getting a haircut, you know? So I have like these bald spots around my neck and then I just go get it shaved up the day of the haircut. And it's pretty simple. Cool. Um, cell salts, your thoughts on those? Yeah. I, I, and I read into those. I've never tried them. So I really don't have any experience with cell salts. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to be like dialed in as far as like the ratios is what we give, you know, a lot of these mineral products I'm sure do correct some deficiencies. Like we're so deficient in almost everything. That's why when people take magnesium, they're like, Oh my God, like, I guess I was deficient in that. And then you know, a year later, it doesn't have the same effect as when they started, you know, because it probably is antagonistic to to calcium and other things. But yeah, I think the cell salts are probably decent for people. I don't never really played with them, but any of these mineral products, you know, B minerals, Sheila G, people get this little bump effect because we are so mineral deficient in almost everything. So when you just get anything coming in, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been using the cell salts, uh, the homeopathic through the infopathy, like into my water, just for like the last two months. And I figure it can't hurt, you know, so. <laughs> I actually have been meaning to buy one of those for a couple of years. I, I love the information on the first one. And now I've seen you post and they have an updated version. So maybe I'll try that out and have them yeah. on a show because I think that's super cool. Yeah, you should have Anton on the show. He's super passionate and uh, it's like alien technology. It's crazy how it works. <laughs> yeah, I think I heard it like five years ago. I think I've been Greenfield podcast or something, and he was like mm -hmm. posting on his Instagram. So I listened to the show. It seems super cool. I'm into a lot of the frequencies. Like I, you know, I I tried scalar when I was healing and have scalar devices and PMF and I did some remote scalar things and, you know, my wife's a Reiki practitioner. So I'm super into like how frequencies and, you know, random energies definitely affect the body. I think they're cool. Awesome. Uh, do coffee enemas disrupt the microbiome or the, the pH? Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that, you know, or science behind that, you know, it's coffee enemas seem to be pretty safe. I don't know anybody who's used them. And I know some people have been like one, two a day for like a decade, you know, or more, you know, I know plenty of people have been doing them every day for a long time. And I haven't seen it. Like if you quit using them, will you, you know, lose, you lose your ability to use the bathroom. I haven't seen that, you know, like I use two a day and then I'll go on vacation for a week or two and I just have regular bowel, bowel movements. So I haven't seen anything like that and, or heard anything like that. It can be a little stimulating for people. I think probably because you are, you know, releasing that bile, maybe moving some copper around. So some people are a little sensitive to it and they kind of have to do a little bit less caffeine. So it's not as, you know, stimulating. And you don't absorb the caffeine in the way that you do drinking coffee either. So if you are sensitive to caffeine, you can actually do coffee enemas and you'll feel fine because it doesn't get absorbed in the same manner. Mm. Is it, I always forget, is it dark or light roast that is recommended? for? I've played around with everything, honestly, besides green coffee. Thaddeus uh, Owen, um, I, th I think you know him as well. He, he's been telling me lately that he's he's been on coffee enemas forever too. And I think he's fine. Um he said that green coffee is the best, but I've played around with like the gold. I buy the gold enema coffee off of Amazon, like big bags of organic. I've tried purity coffee, you know, bulletproof coffee. I, I kind of feel the same on all of them. So I don't know if maybe someone else has a different experience, but I've tried like 
probably four or five different kinds of just organic coffee. And I've got the same experience from all of them. Yeah. We're actually getting, I think in a month, it's taken a while just for the bag design, but I, I have friends in the coffee industry. And so I just I decided to uh, make it a Mito Life product and just small batch farm direct. And I think yeah. it's like uh farmer's markets, you know, the whole organic label, there's so much confusion around that. And it's like, if, if you, if the coffee's coming from a good farm, you know, you know, the origin, <laughs> it doesn't need to be certified organic to be clean. So that's going to be a lot of our messaging. I mean, yeah, if people are super, super sensitive and they need that certified organic mold tested, whatever, and we might do that eventually, but I think it's more important just to get it from a good farm first before the other stuff. Yeah. I will add, I, I, I did tour a really nice, um, coffee farm when I was in Costa Rica and we, you know, they, they basically roasted it right in front of us and did everything. And he showed us the whole process and he, he actually did say like with the humidity and everything, like it's actually kind of easy to get mold if you don't like air it out the right way. And I thought that was interesting because like we were, I didn't, I was always back and forth too. Like does mold really matter? Is mold really on coffee? And I went to this little, really small scale. We did a tour in Costa Rica and he actually kind of brought it up when I was talking to him. So I thought that was interesting. So maybe there's some uh, validity there. It's also probably a sensitivity thing. I think that small dose of mold in your coffee um, is probably more, you know, has a higher probability of causing some kind of symptom if you're already toxic, right? So mercury and mold kind of hang out together. And so if you have already some kind of hypersensitivity to toxins, which usually means you need to detox anyways, then you'll react worse to that mold. Hmm. Well, it's, uh, someone asked, can you see mold exposure signs on HTMA results? <clears throat> and you just said mercury and mold hang out together. So would you generally see high, higher mercury? coming out or uh, well it'd be hard because i would imagine mold to me is terrible you know uh, i know clark has said like mold's a, a weak host issue and it, some of that can be true but i think if you're living in you know mold environment you can collapse and it will actually cause so much inflammation and disruption and sleep and stress on the nervous system that you'll have a tough time even with mineral balancing or any kind of zeolite if you're still exposed to that because you're sleeping there and the problem with mold is you get so much fatigue that you quit going out and doing other things. So then you're just like trapped in there, breathing in more mold. That was my experience at least. So I do always tell people like, you know, what's, you know, where's your environment? Do you know anything about it? Have you had a water leak and things like that? But also we didn't touch on this, but mineral balancing, we focus on the metals because you can basically see them on a chart. So that visual perception for people, just seeing the metals move around is like a win for them. But a lot of times people feel kind of crappy and they don't really see a lot of metals move around and they can get discouraged. But when you're turning on the endogenous detox pathways, you are actually going to get rid of something like mold, like plastics, like glyphosate, because the body is going to be turning back on all of its regulatory mechanisms to actually detox whatever it feels necessary in the moment. And then not all the metals come out in the hair either. We're trying to open up the liver and, you know, help with the kidney support so that people actually detox it through, you know, the bowels, through the urine. That's actually the goal. That's why we give like the GB3, which is the ox bile and the pancreatic enzymes to help that. We give kidney support. We also give TMG because that's going to help turn some of them toxins like water soluble and it's uh, needed for the liver detox pathways. So People think it's just minerals, but it's actually like this complex program because moving around mold, plastics, metals is actually very stimulatory and can cause some congestion within the organs. So we're actually supporting those. And then you actually need extra support usually if you're really toxic, like a coffee enema or a sauna. Did you ever get into ozone therapy? Like I was hitting the ozone insufflations pretty consistently for, I don't know, six months to a year. And I felt pretty good. You know, my friend Charles Barbara, I had like, hours of conversations with him and he was talking about how you build up the ozonides, you know, and I think uh, Frank Schallenberger uh, had a lot of information about that. And these ozonides can circulate for, for weeks and those are super beneficial. Um, just curious if you played around with that or. Yeah, I actually, I have a simply O3 ozone machine. I actually love it. Um, I was doing the ozone therapies with mink off and I was driving out there 35 minutes, giving this dude an arm and like 200 bucks for ozone IV or whatever. And then I'm like, 
I come home and I think Simply 03 is a little bit more now, but it used to be like 12, 1300 bucks. And I know Micah and I've had him on the show. He's a great guy. Um, so I'm like, for like six of these ozone IVs where I'm doing two of them a week, I can just have the thing at home. And maybe the IVs are a little bit more effective, but probably not. If I can do it at home daily, I'm going to get more of a dose than just the two IVs. So I just ended up buying a system and I used to use it a lot more. Now that I've detoxed quite a bit, I've realized that I don't need it as much. And I just use it here and there, or use the ear insufflations. But, you know, Minkoff does have some good information about like when you are detoxing, the ozone really helps the organ system. Just because I think a lot of the toxins can actually mess with oxygen utilization in general. And so we can definitely use a little bit of ozone to help boost that up. Uh, Dr. Wilson doesn't go against it, but he says to only do it like a couple times a week. I can't remember what his um, what his reasoning was for that, but he's not totally against it, but he did, did say don't do it too much. That's interesting about the uh, the toxic metals influencing oxygen utilization because so, you know, ozone helps with that, but also uh, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide. And I've recently been doing the air baths, like the CO2 suit and pumping it, you know, sucking the air out basically with a vacuum, like shrink wrapping myself in like essentially a dry suit and then having a food grade <laughs> CO2 tank and pumping myself up like the Michelin man and just laying there, you know, in, usually in bed for 30, 45 minutes, maybe up to an hour and just listen to a podcast. And I was so surprised to feel so calm after it. And I know CO2, you know, Ray Peets has a ton of information on this, how CO2 uh, increases, you know, you need it to, to utilize oxygen. Um, so I wonder if that's part of why I felt so good. You know, meanwhile, I'm dumping all these metals. <laughs> so... Yeah, the CO2 thing is interesting. Actually, when I had Dr. John Laurence on the show, he's like playing around with some kind of like breath work that also involves CO2. I don't know how much you know about him. I know you interviewed him, but he's like out there. He'll try almost <laughs> anything and he'll try anything with clients. So, I mean, he's really moving the needle. I, I think you are kind of a guinea pig in some of his experiments if you go out there, but I think he is helping a lot of people. And he, he was on my show talking about doing breath work with some kind of CO2 device where you almost are like, I would imagine you feel like you're about to pass out. You're doing the breath work and the CO2. Um, but he said, when you get done, it's like super good for anxiety and you just feel great and you feel calm. So that's yeah. the CO2 might be something like next, like all the biohackers are going to be probably into in the next year or two. Probably. Yeah. And it makes sense because bag breathing, you know, is, is recommended for people to have anxiety. And then I remember Wim Hof breathing was really popular, but that's more like you're increasing oxygen and, and off gassing CO2, you actually want to do the opposite <laughs> to put yourself uh, more in Paris. Like it's my understanding CO2 puts you in a more of a parasympathetic state, whereas <clears> oxygen <throat> is more sympathetic. And of course it's a balance. We need both, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a fun topic. I definitely want to have a show on it. I used to do like a live O2 machine um, that was on, on an exercise bike, but he had me doing these breathing techniques and I was wearing these pulse uh, oximeters and dude, he would have me like holding my breath and exerting force and like my oxygen levels would go really, really low. So like that CO2 was building up and then he would switch back on the oxygen while I was on the bike and it would just be like, boom, and I would feel in insane. And then he would do like PMF and body work on me afterwards. I would leave that place feeling like a million bucks. Wow. Yeah. I feel like all this stuff, I mean, I have hyperbaric and therify and all this stuff here. And it's great. I mean, I wish we had these clinics like this, like my house, basically, <laughs> instead of bars. You know, I hope that that's my hope for the future. If it ever happens, like there's, you know, every little town has access to a place where they can go and get these treatments affordably. But I don't think it's the place to start, right? With all these biohacking uh, treatments. It's like mineral balancing, foundational you know, and then adding this stuff in, whether it's ozone or CO2, or if, if people have the, the monetary means and the time, it could kind of lessen the turbulence, right? It's, yeah, honestly, I had a lot of these biohacks um, from before I started mineral balancing because of all of the years of just feeling off and doing research. And what I've noticed is they all work better since I've been mineral balancing. Because it's like, I'm getting the actual, even colostrum. Like I just, I just started doing colostrum again the other day and it wiped me out. I did like two tablespoons was like, whatever. And it just 
I don't know what it was killing off or what it was doing, but I felt awful. And I used to take two tablespoons of like uh, Sir Thrival colostrum for the longest time when I was sick. But I think now that maybe I have more energy and my immune system's actually working a little bit better, that that colostrum was way more effective than what it probably was when I just, everything was down regulated. The colostrum wasn't strong enough. So it probably wasn't doing as much. It wasn't able to kill off the you know bad bacteria and stuff because the toxins were overriding that. Now I took some colostrum. I was like, man, I got to lower the dose. And then the same thing with like the sauna, like you just feel better after the sauna, like you've actually moved something around the sauna by itself. I used it for like five years or whatever before I actually did mineral balancing and I still had all these metals. So it's, it's really not releasing the metals back to that kind of push catch thing. Use the, the minerals to release the metals, then use the other, the PMF mat, the ozone, the sauna, the coffee enemas to release those metals. So it's like the framework, like you said, and then everything builds upon it. And those things can get expensive. So it's like, we do try to get people into saunas if we can. Like I'll recommend like a Therasage, which is what I've had forever, which is pretty good for 1200 bucks. I'm sure you can get better, but first one. For, yeah. yeah, for, for 1200 bucks, you can't beat it. I think you can even do like a year long payment plan. If I'm not sure, I know Robbie pretty well. I've, I can't remember if he's still doing that, but I think you used to be able to do like a year long payment plan. So if you're going to a clinic and they're going to charge you like 45 bucks for a session, Now you're spending a half hour driving there, sitting in the sauna, spending 45 bucks. You could just pay the monthly payment, have the one in the house and do it more often and more frequently. And then we even recommend like red light bulbs. Like I'll recommend like a sauna space bulb for somebody who doesn't feel like buying a sauna. And that'll still like, if you put that on the kidneys or the abdomen, that'll still help the detox reactions quite a bit just because of the red light. And that was like, you know, they have a cheap one that's like 10 bucks and they have another one that's like a hundred bucks. So it's kind of like whatever your budget is. Yeah. Yeah, when I was on grid, I, I really felt the calming effect of the near infrared lights. That was that was the the thing I noticed the most with it is like, wow, I just feel calm when this is shining on me for five minutes. It's um, insane. I wanted to ask you with the saunas, is there do you think there's an optimal time or can you just use your intuition as long as you're staying hydrated to stay in for like, you know, half an hour or an hour? What are your thoughts just on general timing with saunas? Yeah, I would say low and slow in the beginning for sure. Uh, Definitely. That's what's cool about the infrared saunas as well is you can still feel pretty good on like 130 or something like that, like a pretty like low temperature for a sauna. It doesn't need to be like 200 and probably like 20 minutes is like what I would say, start with, see what that does for you. Because the red light frequencies are still going to take some stress off the kidneys. It's still going to move around the blood flow. You're going to get a lot of benefits. Like too many people are focusing on like, how much can I sweat in here? Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be exhausting and stressful on the body as well, because not everything comes out in the sweat. A lot comes out in the sweat, but then your liver and your kidneys got to, you know, work on the rest that just got moved around. So it's like, Mm -hmm. I would say low and slow with the sauna, maybe, uh, you know, whatever a low temperature is for you, just do 20 minutes and see what that does for you. And then if you're feeling really good in there, I generally do like 30, 35 minutes around 150. And I've been doing it for a long time though. So I'm still not at the the top max and maybe I'll get there if I detox some more. Cause I think the therisage goes up to like 170 or 175, but that's way too hot for me. I'll feel awful. I have a wood burning one. So it's like my hot tub, it's you can't regulate the temperature. You just have to have to time it right. So I'll just open the door to regulate it. And um, yeah, the traditional one's pretty cool because I for years I used the electric infrared one. I think Costco is the one like J and H Lifestyles. I used that for a while, um, which they have a decent product. I don't think EMFs are as big of an issue as they they make it out to be with a lot of saunas, but. Um, yeah, now going to wood burning, it's hard to go back because it's kind of a different experience. I, I really like it. Yeah, I think that they have different benefits. I think the infrared's a little bit better for direct toxicity because of the wavelengths can penetrate through the skin and they actually release the, you know, the metals. And I don't know though, because I also was using the sauna forever and I, I still wasn't detoxing. So maybe I was just too toxic to, for that to happen. But uh, that's, you know, what Robbie, you know, the owner of Therosage has broke down on my show is like the wavelengths can actually penetrate the skin and go a little bit deeper. And then that, that frequency will actually cause the toxin to be released. Whereas like the, so it heats you from the inside out, basically, instead of like the wood burning sauna is like, basically you being in a hot room, it's going to heat from the outside in. And so you, you do still sweat out toxins, but there's been some studies, I think, where they took the sweat 
from people in an infrared sauna and people in uh like a sauna like you have and there's was actually more toxins in the infrared sauna sweat so i think for like what we're dealing with nowadays and definitely like people moving around stuff on the program the infrared's probably more beneficial but any sauna where you're going to move something around you know get the blood flow going because a lot of people actually can't work out I haven't been able to work out very much since I've mineral balancing because it actually puts stress on the adrenals and actually slows down the program because we're trying to build those adrenals up. So when you're moving around a lot, you can't really do as much exercise as you'd prefer. If you're a person who likes to exercise, like I've been into weightlifting my whole life. So the sauna makes me feel like I worked out at least kind of boost those endorphins. You sweat, you can actually feel like you did something and it's, but it's very parasympathetic at the same time. I wonder if just staying in longer, because I average an hour, sometimes longer in there. Dang. And uh, and I take Kintone before and after, you know, those little Kintone shots. And mm-hmm. um, I, I stop the mineral powders just as an experiment and uh, don't feel any different. But um, mm. yeah, I, I got back into resistance bands recently. And that's I, I think that's a really gentle way to, to uh, strength train. And I've seen quick results just with resistant with the um uh you know like the x3 type stuff yeah but that's x3 bar yeah those are legit i've used them one time i thought about buying them that's probably a better option for someone who's like a pattern like you're in with all the metals moving around instead of trying to go run five miles or do some crazy like workout <laughs> yeah like that's what i like to do i love you know i got into power lifting in middle school my brother got me into it because he was a power lifter and it was obviously it, it correlated i played a lot i was really good at football so it was obviously they went hand in hand so while the hardest part for me has been learning how to have a little bit more positive self-talk when I don't have the muscles that I usually do, when I'm a little bit skinnier than I normally am. Luckily, my wife still loves me and, you know, all of that. But yeah, that's the hardest part. But I do think that once you balance out the minerals, those actually will help you look better in general, especially like calcium, very anabolic. It's good for lifting. And also you're you're putting stress on the system when you're lifting like that. So you're going to deplete even more minerals when you're already living in this stressful environment. You know, people think that they're like, oh, well, my life's not really that stressful. It's like, well, the toxins are in the system and it's causing the stress. Even if your day-to-day life seems kind of just nonchalant, the actual nervous system is stressed. And then you're you're actually using those hormones you create and working out to actually override how you actually feel. So I think a lot of people who are addicted to working out probably was even me. So I'm speaking from experience, just would push through the workouts because that's what would get rid of that depression. That's what would override the overall toxicity and make me feel better. And then at some point I just collapsed and I couldn't do it much, very much anymore. So a lot of people are actually addicted to working out simply because, you know, it's like an opiate like effect when you work out all of the hormones it creates. And so they're using that to override. Like some people are like, I, I, I can't not work out. Well, that's a problem. Like you should feel pretty good if you worked out or if you didn't. I, I'm definitely for working out. But if you're like, feel like you're <clears throat> so I'm super depressed and you can't go on with life, if you miss two workouts, that's a problem. Yeah. Well, earlier you were saying the connection with uh, potassium and uh, cortisol, cortisone. I know that you know, like fat weight loss and that whole subject is always trending right and and i think i i get asked often what do you recommend for you know weight loss what are the the quick tips and it sounds like mineral balancing and specifically potassium and maybe you would say sodium too kind of balancing those would help drop some abdominal fat and i mean just the toxins in general um this is a whole different kind of rabbit hole but they're actually these toxins are obesogens they actually store in the fat cells And if there's not enough fat cells for all of the toxins you have, they'll create more. And then also your thyroid and your testosterone is definitely reflective of how thin you'll be. So some people who have all this extra weight, who kind of eat good and everything, they probably are most likely just have a lot of excess toxins. And then that's also blocking the the hormones in general, because that inflammation will actually block the hormones from actually getting to the receptor sites on the cell. So the people always say like, you know, my thyroid's not working. It's like the thyroid's working. The signals aren't actually getting into the cell. And so because of the inflammation that's blocking it. So it's like a cascade effect, but also just the more, even just like glyphosate or something that builds up, the body just creates more fat cells. And I know this from experience because I used to just work out super hard, 
eat really clean. And I just never really got into like the actual shape that I thought that I should have been in my whole life. And I think it was basically because of all the toxins. I mean, I was drinking and stuff too, but I, I knew a lot of people that were drinking and still working out in college and looked a lot better than me. And I was working out harder than them. Wow. Yeah. I think I was, I'm in the weak foundation. You know, there's that theory of being uh, born with a strong foundation or, 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 uh, weak or medium or whatever, definitely in the, <laughs> you know, and my parents did the best they could, but you can kind of look at your parents, see what they're dealing with. You know, if you know your grandparents, that's what I've done a lot the last 15 years and being into natural health, just like studying that being like, Oh, okay. I could kind of see where some mineral deficiencies came in. Mom was pescatarian her whole life, you know, uh, are you still okay on time Matt? if we do like five more quick questions or i got I got as long as you need <laughs> awesome yeah this is fun uh how often do you see people reversing gray hair this is another popular topic and it it's copper and zinc related often right yeah zinc definitely is needed for hair growth and i think even hair color and that's probably a big reason why we see more and more people going gray earlier now, will you go from being a silver fox back to having hair color of Matt Blackburn? I, I would probably say probably not. You know, there was like the Jason Hommel was showing that his hair was reversing a little bit and stuff, but he never really got it all the way dialed in. Right. I think it's same thing with balding. Like once that goes back, the hairline goes back to a certain extent just because you start mineral balancing, then I don't know if it's going to regrow all the hair. Now I have seen little hairs sprout in the front. Um, because I have like a man bun up top that my barber has had to cut off. So I feel like that is maybe from the red light or maybe just from the minerals, like I'm having new hair sprout up, but I don't know if it would completely reverse like a hairline. I think at some point you might just be too far gone and you might just have to, um, just accept that you're, you're the silver Fox or you can dye it and look kind of weird. Cause I think that's always kind of weird, at least for men, whenever men dye their hair, I'm like, just, just shave it off or go with the gray, you know? I have the, there's a million red light helmets now. I like the Weber. It's pricey again, back to expensive, but I feel like if you add this to a pro protocol, maybe mineral balancing, you know, and having it red LEDs red on your scalp, there's research on it is super beneficial. Yeah. There's also like a C60, like Ian Mitchell. And I think even Jay Campbell, a big TRT guy promotes like different C60 rubs and people are starting to get better. I think at regrowing the hair. So I would actually look into something more like one of those, like a topical thing that you might want to do if it's starting to recede, because I think science is getting a little bit better with the red light helmets, with some of the C60 like stuff that they're rubbing on their scalp, It'll probably be a little bit more beneficial. But also if you're just going to keep having deranged mineral patterns and mineral deficiencies, it's probably not just going to work by just the topical. So it's probably like a balance of both. Mm -hmm. Uh. And stop showering in tap water, right? Get a shower filter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, like the, the chlorine and the chloramine, I can imagine have to just disrupt the system. I mean, it's like chlorine is just like an antibacterial, like broad spectrum. Like, what do you think it does to like your healthy microbiome? Like you're, you know, we are bacteria as well. And so like, I think in Tampa, we even have chloramine, which is like a chlorine, I think ammonia mix or something. Mm -hmm. So I had to buy... Uh, pristine hydro was the only company that I could find that would actually filter out the chloramine. It was like 175 bucks. So it wasn't like insanely pricey, I but that's the one I've been promoting for years. Yeah. This yeah. Is, this is the yeah. best one I've found actually cool for a shower. Idea. Yeah. We're actually yep. working on one for Mito life. That's I think better, but just for the, uh, the filtration media volume. So, mm. it, so it is the more, the better, like a shower filter years ago I had when I was in San Diego, yeah, there's like, and we might make one like a three stage that sits on the floor. If you have like a stand up shower without a bath, mm. you know, where it's going down into this, you know, huge <laughs> three stage, you know, cartridge thing. But uh, practically, yeah, I think if it's just screw on, you want more of the better volume because it's the water's going through there so fast that you right. want to have more material for it to react with. And you see that I tried a Home Depot one on one of my trips recently, and it's like, a little dinky, you open it up and you're like, is this going to do anything? <laughs> yeah. And they're like 40 bucks, you know, yeah. you get what you pay for is the, what, it, with all this health stuff, it sucks. Cause it adds up. And some yeah. people are like, how, how'd you afford all this? It's like, you just get like two things a year. Right. It's like you spend like a couple grand a year, like a thousand bucks a year. And then it just adds up. Now I have 
two air doctors and a molecule, which I think a lot of us got ripped off on the molecule, but it's still a decent air filter. Um, you know, I got the sauna and the PMF map, but that yeah, I've been doing, been buying things over the years. It wasn't like I just, if you have the funds, cool, snag it all up. But sometimes if you have the funds, you can get hooked into some of these like new technologies yeah. that haven't really had longevity. So I also caution people on buying any tech that they hear on a podcast yeah. because sometimes that person's getting paid to promote yeah. that or it's you know not as effective as what we thought it was going to be. And that's kind of how I got trapped with the molecule, I think. Yeah. Yeah. All my devices I pay full price for. So it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's a good message. I, I started used just Craigslist. If you have that, that's where I bought my first Therisage was like, I don't know, 600 bucks or something. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Uh, worked great for years. Um, let's see. I haven't heard of this <clears throat> different. I guess there's recommended diets for different oxidation states. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yep. That's so in fast oxidation, you are actually your guy. You have a faster metabolism and you're kind of burning through things more. So we actually are going to increase the fat on a fast oxidation protocol. You're going to feel better by adding in more fat. Now, that's probably where it gets into this carnivore argument and this keto argument where they're eating loads and loads of fat and feeling better. I would probably guess that almost all of them are in fast oxidation because they're digesting the fat better. It's slowing them down. It's bringing down the parasympathetic state that you have with being in too much of a fast oxidation where you can get irritable and angry. The fat kind of slows it down. Now in slow oxidation, they need a little bit less fat and maybe some more carbs for energy, not like 500 carbs a day, but you know, more of a carbohydrate style diet, but we're always focusing on the, um, animal protein, which can be tough. Some people, you, you get their client questionnaire and they're just like eating bagels and like pasta for dinner. It's like, you have to focus on protein because the amino acids coming from the proteins are actually effective in actually stopping you from uptaking the metals that's coming in the diet, but also just for detox in general. Like I love uh Keon aminos, even on top of all of the animal protein I eat, especially because of the um, L histidine that's in there because the L histidine, a lot of people don't talk about, but it is actually effective for heavy metal toxicity. And there's also rodent studies that shows that it will utilize or mobilize um, copper out of the liver. So I actually like the uh, amino acid essential aminos. They're different than BCAAs that actually have L-histidine in there. So that's why I use Keon. I used to use Dr. Minkoff's for a long time, but I did some research on the L-histidine and use that. So I will tell people they can, they can take that if they don't eat a whole bunch of protein and it's hard to stomach. But usually once you give them the zinc and the other minerals, they actually get more of an appetite back and they actually changes the way they want to eat. So sometimes I'm a little bit more flexible in the beginning and try to just get them on the minerals and see if that changes. But yeah, that's what that's what we do is the, the higher fat um, content and obviously different supplements. When you're in fast oxidation, the fat will help to slow them down. The people who have more fatigue and uh, things like that in slow oxidation, they'll actually do better on a little bit more carbs, healthy carbs, you know, and just as long as they're not overdoing it, because if you do too many carbs, especially like in the form of white sugar, that'll actually um, mess with the calcium to magnesium ratio because that's your blood sugar ratio. So when your blood sugar is going all over the place, then, you know, that actually disrupts the ratio. So you want to be always in a balance. Like we're always in this argument of like, let's eat 400 carbs a day and spike our blood sugar like 10 times. And, you know, and then the carnivore people are like, you know, one teaspoon of sugar in your bloodstream is going to kill you. And it's like insane. It's like, dude, you know, you can just eat normal, right? You can have protein, you can have some veggies, a little bit of fruit, some maple syrup, some raw honey, and like, you'll probably be pretty good, but yeah, you'll increase the fat and fast oxidation. So specifically for you, you, you probably already eat a decent amount of fat, but you could even bump it up a little bit and see how you feel. Yeah. I put a decent amount of ghee with my eggs every morning, three from my chickens, three eggs every morning with a substantial amount of ghee and full fat milk and probably get a good amount just breakfast. But yeah, it's funny. You, you talk about the, <laughs> the white sugar because looking out my window, I mean, there's snow, there's no fruit out here. The health food store, the fruit tastes horrible this time of year. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to grow it in my greenhouse. And, but uh, yeah, I think maple syrup, honey, potentially white sugar, you know, I'm, I'm probably a 1% case, you know, way up here in the North. But uh, for several months out of the year, I don't have access to ripe, high quality fruit. I guess I could ship it in or something overnight, possibly from somewhere else. But 
Yeah, I think actually, you know, I had a show with Thaddeus about this is you're also your light exposure is part of this too, right? So you're not getting as much UV light there in the in the winter and he lives in Wisconsin. So he actually does go keto for a couple months and then cycles his diet because he he told me basically you wouldn't do good on keto living in, living in Florida, no matter what your genetics are mm -hmm. because of the UV light. So I can actually tolerate more carbs in general being down here. So there's a lot that goes into like light information because it's like if you're living in Idaho and eating, uh, you know, a banana from Mexico in the middle of January, that, you know, might not register. I don't follow that um, exactly, but I do think there might be some validity there. But, you know, and mineral balancing, it's like if you want to have some fruit, enjoy it. Um, my business partner does think that he'll see more of that toxic potassium come out if people do eat more fruit. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, I feel best when I'm eating fruit frequently. Um, yeah, it's probably the way to go. I think that the, at least it has like the minerals and the nutrients in there. So it's not just like this plain white sugar. I know you kind of backed off of that quite a bit. And I think that the sugar can be disruptive, but also just how well you tolerate carbs in general. You know, from that calcium to magnesium ratio, which actually, you know, regulates insulin and, you know, how you respond to blood sugar in general. Then also chromium. Chromium is actually needed. You know, they give this to diabetics. Mm, so yeah. we have chromium. Uh, some people on chromium, especially if they have diabetes, I'll give them a little extra chromium. And it's also used for protein and fat digestion as well, but also to regulate the blood sugar. So you actually have a more balanced you know, reaction to that blood sugar. And I think over time, because if you look back even 100 years ago, people were just eating whatever they want. Like even when I was a little kid, I was eating donuts and chocolate milk for breakfast. And I might not eat for like seven hours after that. I just play video games or something. I don't know. Like you didn't really think about it. And now everyone's like, you have to eat every three hours or it's like, yep. you should never eat. You yep. should only eat once a day. And it's kind of insane. It the is, fasting yeah. community, I feel like has poor digestion. That's my, that's my take on it. Mm -hmm. So they don't feel that good when they eat food. So if you, if you don't feel good when you eat food, of course you feel better when you, when you fast, but that's really just a problem with digestion. Cause they're right. like, Oh, I just get all my work done in the morning and then I eat lunch. And then when they eat lunch, it's like just beef. And it's like, you, you really have problems with digestion. People in yeah. Europe are eating croissants for breakfast and they, <laughs> they work or they work all day. <laughs> yeah. I did the continuous glucose monitors, like levels for, I don't know, a year or something. And it was a, it was a good experiment because you can try different supplements like chromium or whatever with a, a meal and see how it affects you. That was my favorite way to use it. Not just to see, you know, the spikes, but to see how the supplements affected the meal, which is really cool. Yeah. There's cool supplements like berberine and different things you can take if you want um, to try to regulate that a little bit, which could be cool if you're having Apple blood sugar issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's even yeah. more simple, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but what I've noticed is that I used to have to like be that low carb keto guy. And the more I just keep getting the heavy metals out, especially because a lot of them are in the pancreas, which actually affect just your blood sugar response in general. So where I think maybe a lot of that CGM data is a little skewed by people who do have toxic metals or deranged mineral patterns in general, because now like when I, uh, my wife and I throw retreats and usually I could never eat the bread, even though it was sourdough and I wouldn't have any carbs because I wanted to be more clear thinking for the retreat. And this last retreat, I was eating lasagna, sourdough bread, like having maple syrup in my coffee. And it didn't really affect me at all. And I thought that's pretty bizarre because I used to not be able to do that before mineral balancing. So I must be, changing the way that I actually respond to those sugars. Oh, that's cool. Uh, it's kind of a big question. In what situations do you use manganese, which we kind of touched on a little bit already, um, but molybdenum? I don't think we spoke on molybdenum. Yeah. So actually, Dr. Paul Leck didn't use molybdenum in much, but I will tell you a case in where we will. Um, when someone starts to dump copper, we actually will give them maybe like a seeking health molybdenum and some anisotol because when they release the copper, it's, it's actually kind of rough. I haven't went through a huge copper dump yet and I've heard they're pretty terrible. They actually, some practitioners will recommend that you just buy the molybdenum and the anisotol like just to have it so that if you do think that you're going through a copper dump, you can try it out because it'll bind to the copper and it'll actually ease the symptoms. And the anisotol is really good for like kind of calming you down. And that's one of the reasons we give the fast oxidizers a little anisotol and the SPF because they're a little bit faster pace, a little bit more stress and anxiety. So that kind of help calm them down. And 
Um, a nice stall is just a good supplement in general for, you know, calming down and having anxiety. If you've never tried it, it's pretty, pretty solid, but yeah, molybdenum is definitely good during a copper dump, but we don't use the actual like measurement in the hair to supplement molybdenum. Um, as far as what I've researched and the people that follow more of the mineral balancing stuff, we don't think that's as significant in hair. So like, you know, like, uh, trace elements, they'll, they'll measure a lot of these, like really trace minerals and things, but they're not that significant in the body. Like we talked about that post that Clark had where like your major minerals make up all of almost all of your minerals. And then the other ones you can kind of get a gauge of, but a lot of the ones that trace element does like iodine and sulfur and all these things, Vanadium. they're in such, yeah, all these like small things. They're in such trace amounts that we don't really know if, um, if that's valid or not. And, you know, we find by balancing out the macro minerals and, you know, given the kelp and the iodine and more so balancing out the ratios, we see that work across the board on, you know, what we need and it detoxes. So I don't focus as much on like sulfur and, but the molybdenum does help during a copper dump. Interesting. I, I wonder if that's, I mean, it, I still enjoy shilajit. I sell it and, and it's a great source of the ultra trace minerals, like the weird ones, you know, the for sure vanadium and all the small, uh, tungsten strontium. <laughs> yeah. Like we talked about that. Like I don't, I wouldn't have a problem with someone doing Shilaji on my program. I don't think it would move the needle that much. That's their like negative in, like in terms like of like 30 grams. A dis, day. Dis, <laughs> yeah. I think you'd have to take some insane amount. Like maybe you who owns a company would do something like that, but even you probably you take, it's probably higher. Cause I think you recommended like a gram a day at some point. I don't know how much you take now, but I don't know if there's enough in there to actually influence these patterns. It would be interesting yeah. to just see somebody who takes Sheila Jeet and, you know, I think that the main protocol would still override that little bit of like trace minerals that you're getting in that, in the uh, Sheila Jeet. Mm -hmm. uh, th thoughts on mineral balancing while on a medication that blocks sodium uh, epilepsy meds. Wow. Super interesting. I, I, you know, obviously I am a uh, unlicensed nutrition person, you know, a uh, practitioner. So I, I, I never tell anyone to get off of anything. There are, you know, times where I say, you know, if you're on blood pressure medication and I start giving you zinc, it could drop too low. You might want to work with them and like try to figure out, um, you know, on lowering the dose, or maybe if you feel really comfortable coming off it, but that's always between you and the doctor. So that would be between them. Um, Epilepsy is interesting. I wonder if there would be some way to balance out. I know like CBD has good effects. I would imagine just calming the nervous system through the, through the mineral balancing may have some effects directly on that, but I haven't worked with anybody with epilepsy or who's ever been on a medication like that. So I can't speak to that. Yeah. I have some experience with it. Like I'm still, even though I'm on carbs, the HVMN exogenous ketones, Ray Pete was actually a huge fan of exogenous ketones. Um, and uh, that's incredible for epilepsy and heart conditions. Uh, like if I had those going on, I would definitely be taking one, three butane dial daily. I would probably just be on a ketogenic diet in general until I figured it out. You know, that's where like keto is therapeutic, in my opinion, as far as instead of like some long-term thing that you're just on to try to lose weight or because you think that you should be burning ketones all day. I look at it more as like therapeutic. Like if I got a tumor or cancer or something right now, I'd probably be on some kind of plant-based, like low protein kind of ketogenic diet until I figured that out. And so something like epilepsy, definitely, you know, ketones. I like the Tecton. I'm not sure if you've played with that yet. Um, it's a new, it's a new uh, ketone supplement. It's attached to a different molecule. I can't remember all the details, but it's not the butane dial. It's a, uh, it's a ketone ester that's connected to like a glycerol or something different. And, um, I, I loved it. I tried, I was drinking like two a day when I was down at Thaddeus's, um, mastermind like a month ago. Okay. Yeah. I found it interesting. Yeah. I've tried a few different brands and I tried the hard ketones for a while and then <laughs> I got scared. So I'm like, are they cutting it with something? Cause it's the same as HVMN, same ingredient, just two, but you feel loopy, grams. feel drunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I did those for a while too. They're interesting. <laughs> um last question here i think it's a good one to end on what should someone look for when they're searching for an htma practitioner this is tough i have to constantly 
like put people on um, like I on, on like a protocol like mine and I I hear the disasters that come from like a, a practitioner that they had before and like you know one one client in particular went to a practitioner I'm not sure how much she paid but she basically the practitioner told her to just take dandelion root that was the only supplement that they that they recommended another friend of mine they she paid for a, a console i think she was like a friend to her so i don't think she got charged too much but they just basically told the, her to eat more cop or more liver i don't know if that was like because of the copper levels or what was like the reasoning behind that but it's like it's confusing to see like some like how can you look at all of these metals and minerals and then recommend dandelion root that's kind of insane so you, it's i and i think probably i would have to say upwards of like 90 percent of the HTMA community, in my opinion, is kind of doing more of this re replacement theory and they're scared wow. to detox people when I feel like, like that's the whole point. <laughs> the, the minerals are supposed to push out the metals. That's kind of the point and turn on the detox system. So I don't know if they're like scared to like be the practitioner that the person leans on while the person's having symptoms and going through episodes. Cause that's part of like why you pay a practitioner because not just for the console that's like in between when you're having the detox issues like arise, like you're going to email me or I'm going to get on a call with you and tell you to back off something or try something. Right. And so I would say anybody, you would want to make sure that they're really following <clears throat> Dr. Paul X work and Dr. Wilson's. Because outside of that, I don't know how well anything works. Every person that I've put on a protocol that kind of follows like Dr. Eck and Dr. Wilson has done really well. They've at least gotten better. If they quit the protocol, they usually at least admit that they could tell it was doing something. They just didn't feel like pushing through the detox, right? And so that's who you want to look for. If they're not posting something about Dr. Paul Eck or Dr. Wilson, then it's probably more of a replacement theory or some other program that I'm not sure if it works. If they're not using Indomet or probably Valence Nutraceuticals, my supplement company, it's probably not mineral balancing. It might be more replacement theory. Although I'll give credit when I listened to the show with Robert, I thought he really did understand mineral balancing and uses different products. I'd be interested to see like what a program actually looks like from him because like a lot of the things he said did line up with Dr. Wilson, Dr. Eck, but I don't know like what supplements he's working, but it did sound like he's doing copper dumps and metal dumps. So someone like Robert, who's really taken the time to research for decades and understand the mineral in interactions, but just decided to try to use better supplements, maybe someone like him, but most everybody who I know is doing a good job is using Indomet. And then now a lot of them have signed up and have been using Valence Nutraceuticals, which are the supplements that we've reformulated that are still Dr. Paul X ratios. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, I'll put the the links below so people can check out Valence Nutraceuticals and then your uh, podcast, Integrative Thoughts. Um, anywhere else you want people to check out? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm on Instagram at integrative Matt, just kind of a play on words with integrative thoughts. Um, my business partner's got a really dope, um, HTMA. I, you know, that, that, um, that detailed report I sent you is, is a new AI app. It's super dope. If anybody's a practitioner who's listening and isn't using hair analysis report, um, definitely check that out. I can send you the link if you want to put that in the show notes, because it'll read a lot of the, like you can spend all day figuring out all of the patterns and, you know, doing the math on, you know, all those percentages, like you used to have to do those by like a calculator. So like the AI does like how, how much the potassium raised, how much the metals lowered and gives you that percentage, gives you a detailed report about the oxidation rate and all of the ratio. So if you're a practitioner, it's geared towards practitioners, obviously to save us a little bit of time. And it's also like all of your client information is in one, one place like saved within the app. So it's pretty cool. So if you guys are a practitioner who's listening, um, definitely look up a hair analysis uh, report. It makes your life a lot easier being a practitioner. And yeah, just Instagram, Integrative Matt, um, mine and the same one of my, my business partner who created that app is also in on the supplement companies with another guy. So there's three of us and we are recreating the Endomet line into what we think are better forms. And so far we have the zinc matrix pro out as our zinc, the NAK up is a Lymcoman substitute. And then our slow ox is the mega pan substitute, which is like the multivitamin multi-mineral and the cow mag is arriving tomorrow, but we already sold everything in pre-order. So we probably won't have another one of those for like another month or two. Cool. 
yeah, and if if you guys want to save five percent, Blackburn on Valence Nutraceuticals saves you a little <laughs> bit. So, yeah, I'll have to add you to my website. I have, I have to update that soon. Add my CO two thing and your products to it. <laughs> cool, so, would love that. Because there's um, a lot of people you know who just take zinc without a, a mineral balancing thing, and I know even like Symbiotica sells like a, a zinc to copper thing that people take and there's some people that just take a multivitamin. So if if that, if you're in that camp and you don't want to pay for a test, like, you know, the products are still there, but I do recommend a test usually so I can kind of gauge where you're at, but they are like, you know, a CalMag is pretty safe for everybody. I would think like anybody could take a CalMag supplement, might even be something that we could put on Amazon. So they're, they're there for people who aren't doing mineral balancing as well, but I would prefer you to have a test through a practitioner for sure. Even if it's not me. Well, I'm going to be the Guinea pig. I'll do just your NAK up melatonin and the zeolite and then i'll retest and let you know what happens <laughs> yeah it'll be cool to play around with someone who's just on the, the zeolite and the melatonin um just to see because you know jeff and i have them discussions like will people just release copper and manganese and stuff like just by detoxing the metals themselves like are those what are disrupting the actual mechanisms and not the mineral balancing in general but there are like some issues like um in fast oxidation i know you like to do a lot of vitamin e that's more of a slow oxidation thing. And you were in slow oxidation on your first test. So you actually might've felt better, but maybe not in fast oxidation. Same thing with like a lot of iodine. You might feel worse in fast oxidation on a lot of iodine. So that's where we get into the testing and it gets into the weeds, but yeah. So which, you know. Are there fat soluble vitamins that are more associated with supporting fast oxidizers? Like, yeah, uh, like I think vitamin they get, D or they get uh vitamin A, vitamin C, we have everybody on vitamin D. I've been using the D.Velop stuff for That's a lot of my awesome. clients. Yeah. They like that. But even if you just do like Thorn or Seeking Health, mm -hmm. I like something with a little K2 in it. But I think Endomet just sells like straight up vitamin D3. Yeah, we it's supportive and it's super supportive in the beginning. And, you know, there's a vitamin D like back and forth battle. But <laughs> when you are dealing with a lot of chronic infections, especially in the beginning of mineral balancing, that's actually going to have an effect on the mineral levels and also your ability to fight off things. And then maybe after you balance out for a while and you're getting a lot of sunlight, maybe you drop that dosage to once a week or you quit taking it and see how you feel. But in the beginning, when you're fighting off a lot of infections, like vitamin D is obviously super critical for the immune system. Yeah. I, I read a really interesting book on, cause I always go to the megadose just to research it and see the effect in the Coimbra protocol. Like mm. He was using like up to 200,000 IUs and for like MS and different, uh, different conditions and short term, you know, just for a couple of weeks or a month. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. I think some of this stuff, like, like I said, like the iodine, I think is probably good. If you have severe deficiency short term, are you supposed to take a hundred milligrams a day? A lot of this stuff can be mega dose, but then once people start to feel good on it, they just say, I'm going to do this forever. Mm -hmm. And then at some point that causes some kind of error in the system. Cause that's just not natural. Yeah. And it looks like you have a He-Man or is that like an upgrade to the gas station boner pill? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my, my uh, business partner, that's kind of all him. He's loving this. I actually, uh, we have the sample in. Um, I've took it a couple days this week. I actually liked it. It does have a little bit of Sheila Jeet in there some different herbal products and things like that. Uh, I think peak ATPs in there. There's some cool stuff in there. It's a pretty unique. We're going to update that formula. The, the lab we got that through didn't have exactly all of the ingredients that we wanted. So we're, we already had it in process, but I think we're going to even upgrade that after this yeah, first run. Turkisteroin. Turkisteroin is an interesting one. And then the Chrysin, some interesting ingredients in there. Yeah, it's a little unique. Yeah. My my business partner goes deep in the weeds with um, Aaron. He's crazy. If you guys don't follow him, uh, Redox Stasis, he's posting some some uh, some something from some research like three times a day. I feel like he's he's a posting machine when it comes to different things. And he's you know with our thyroid complex, we we are actually adding in like black cumin seed and some some things that Endomet hasn't used that we think might be like a little bit more beneficial in the more toxic era, you know. So I think mm. some of that stuff can actually be valid for sure. That's awesome. And if someone wants to work with you, should they go through your Instagram? Like if they want to get an HTMA done and have you analyze it or yeah, um integrative thoughts. <laughs> Dot com is my website. You can go to the HTMA section on there, or if you find me on Instagram, I have a link tree and there's a, a tab there that says HTMA consultation. So you can do either one of those. Cool. Yeah. I'll put all the, those links below and Matt, it was, it was awesome to, to talk with you. Uh, thanks brother. So thanks much for fun. having me on. 
Yeah. yeah I, I honor you. I think you, um, you definitely helped my health for the better with your shows. And, um, you know, I listened to a lot of podcasts before I found yours and I feel like you bent the narrative just a tad bit on the alternative health, you know, for better or worse, whatever you want to, some of, <laughs> you know, there's a, some that, you know, I don't agree with anymore, but I still think that it got my gears turning and got me into the mineral world. Like even doing the Morley and the Jason and it all kind of built upon itself. And now I have a business around it and a supplement company. So it's all probably stemmed from your podcast. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. I love everything you're doing and, um, yeah, have your website pulled up. We didn't even touch on combo. That's something I've never experienced. <laughs> Maybe we can do another hold show on. about that. Yeah, I love talking other. about it. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting. And I think it can be, um, an adjunct therapy, but you also have to do that in person. So, um, yeah, we could do another show maybe around that. Yeah. Well, highly recommend check out his, his podcast, Integrative Thoughts. And, um, yeah, thanks, man. This was a lot of fun. Stick around to close out the show. Cool. Will do. I think it's pretty cool that Matt Kaufman has a lot of experience trying a whole lot of different things before he came to HTMA. It was really cool to hear him talk about the different ratios and what they mean. One of the most interesting ones to me was the calcium to magnesium ratio. He called it the blood sugar ratio that often determines how well people handle carbohydrates. It's weird because on my test that's really recent, like about a month ago, it is pretty high, but I do tolerate carbs really well. Like if I don't eat carbs or enough carbs in a day, I do feel not as good. But when he said that it being high is often a lifestyle factor, like non-nutrition related, I really related to that and that made sense with my chart. I did make a social media post on high dosing melatonin and I had some people asking if I'm going to be transparent with the before and after and I could say I'm already well into the experiment because my first test it was a few years ago but I was taking zero melatonin and with this last test, I've been high dosing it, taking an average of 200 milligrams a night for the last, I don't know, six to nine months, somewhere in there. So I am going to retest and see if my levels balanced out, especially since adding that Zeolite product that Matt talked about. Being vulnerable here, I'm still trying to find the balance like he was talking about daily enemas and sauna. It's kind of a full-time job. And especially when I'm here on the homestead by myself managing stuff, there's just a lot of juggling. But I am actively working on starting the fire in my wood-burning barrel sauna because I'm off-grid and getting in the routine of doing that minimum every other day is my goal. And I've done that in the past and I always felt better, even though I had no idea about mineral balancing and all of these deep vitamin and mineral interactions. Like he said, Robert Selig put it great and he didn't want to parrot him, but this is just one more reminder and hopefully hearing it from Matt Kaufman helps that those two practices are so powerful for the liver and the kidneys, especially if you know that you had exposure to these toxic metals. And like you said, the different forms of minerals that shouldn't be in the tissues. I feel like I've said it a million times, but I just love that it's non-invasive, you know, urine test, stool test, hair test. You can tell a lot just with those three tests. I just see these biohackers just sticking themselves so often. If it's once a year, you're checking on your ferritin, your 25D, sure, that's awesome. But doing it every couple months, I know when I donated blood twice, the second one just wrecked me and I was down and out for several months. So it's Definitely something to be aware of, of how much blood you're giving up, not only in blood donation, but in 
these blood tests. So I would much rather opt for hair, urine, and stool tests. So as Matt said, his Instagram is Integrative Matt. Highly recommend his podcast, Integrative Thoughts. He has a lot of really great shows on there. His website's integrativethoughts.com. His supplement company, Valence Nutraceuticals. Dot com And as I mentioned, if you use the code Blackburn, you'll save a little bit. I am playing around with his NAK up supplement. I'm not on the full quote unquote program, kind of doing my own thing and mixing things up, which is not what these practitioners would recommend. You're on these very specific supplements and only those supplements. But as I've said in previous HTMA podcasts, I would be out of integrity if I wasn't taking my own Mito Life supplements. So I take all of them and I don't mega dose all of them. I take some lower dose and like the melatonin, some higher dose. My website is matt-blackburn.com. You can read about my CLF protocol. You can click the shop tab and see all of my recommended products, most of which have discount codes and at least half of them I've had podcast episodes about. Mitolife is my brand. It's mitolife.co is the website. We have the best seven stage undercounter water filter on the market. Really high quality components, USA made, open source as far as the Omni Pure filters that are made right here in Idaho. It's just super clean. I've used a lot of different water filters over the years. I think for the price, the value, it's just an incredible system that I'm really happy to share with you all. We have grounding sheets, really clean shampoo and conditioner. We have coffee that's upcoming. I'm really excited about. And then a ton of different encapsulated, for the most part, products, with the exception of the Panacea Shilajit tablets, which I take five of those a day. So that's one gram. Each tablet is 200 milligrams, and I take that after breakfast with my coffee, and I feel really good taking it with coffee. I do that every single day. Uh, same as the Dissolve It All, right when I get up, I drink a good glass of water with about three capsules of the systemic enzymes. I'm getting a lot of incredible feedback on the two newer products, which are the Jellyfish Collagen and the Encephalon. Uh, the Jellyfish is currently on sale for half off, which is really affordable. It's essentially at cost for us, so highly recommend giving that a shot. It would go great with your morning coffee. A lot of people have been telling me they feel a stress resilience effect from it and a mental clarity, which makes sense because it's a source of all the amino acids essential and quote non-essential as well as a ton of minerals which are cofactors for enzymatic reactions check out the mitolife life academy on youtube that's 15 dollars a month you gain access to two private videos every month just latest things that i'm experimenting with and researching and then the last day of every month there's a live q a that is all for today i'll see you guys next friday Stay supercharged.